Santa Barbara Unified School District's Board of Education for Tuesday, March 14th, 2017. And we are going to start this open session by rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Matsuoka. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, the indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tenemos interpretación al español por si alguien gusta escuchar la reunión en español. Thank you. And we also have headsets available for the hearing impaired over at the side table here if anybody needs them. And that moves us forward to item C5, introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions. And I believe it's going to be Ms. Carey. On the <laughs> we have a student board report first. Oh, there we go. Sure. Oh, there we go. Hey. It's like a, if mother was here, there must be a daughter here, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm Georgia Brace from Santa Barbara High School. So at La Cuesta, there's a Museum of Tolerance field trip on March 22nd. Um, also at La Cuesta, Wyatt Irwin and Kayla Orozco were, le were selected to have their art displayed in the F Faulkner Gallery as part of the Grandparent Portrait Project sponsored by the Student Art Fund. The two were part of the 100 of 150 selected out of 500 ap applicants. Art show is open to the public through April. Also, oh, at Alta Vista, middle college students are just heading into project season. They are finishing the book. Freakonomics and will be making Shark Tank presentations on their new and, and innovative use of two common household items to improve their lives, our lives. <laughs> Seniors have made their Something That Matters project proposals for using their strengths and resources to execute an activity that will make, an, that will make a difference for someone else. Juniors are currently conducting informational interviews as part of their college and career projects. Individual students have been doing exciting things. Claire Rossi won the 101010 Screenwriters Award in the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And Jackson Gillies opened for Jimmy Messina at the recent Benef Benefit concert at the Libero Theater. Also at Alta, Viz Alta Vista, there's a Quetzal Homeboy Industry field trip. Students at Avis have been working on, a PBL, on PBL conflicts. Um, in language arts, they will be working on an, analyzing how literacy con conflicts are used to develop themes. In history, students are examining contemporary conflicts. Their, cult their cult culminating project is to research a, con a contemporary conflict and to utilize negotiation strategies to come up with ways to mediate the selected conflict. At DP, there are acts to raise social awareness, gender like Gender Equality Month, Kick Butts Tobacco Control Day on March 15th, 2017, and, water, and World Water Day on March 22nd, 2017. There are also acts to, ways, acts to raise awareness about intercultural relations, like American Irish History Month and Continual Preparation for International Day on April 28th, 2017, from 12 to 1 p.m. The leadership 2017 and 18 school year recruitment begins the week of March 20th. March on, Mar on March 20th, there's a lunchtime information meeting forum where students can explore and ask questions about being in student government slash leadership at Dos Pueblos in room P2. There's a mandatory meeting, meeting for all students interested in running for class office, ASB office, or being part of the DPHS leadership class at 7 a.m. in the EPAC, Thursday, March 23rd. National Honor Society installation ceremony is for freshmen at Dos Pueblos Ealing's Performing Arts Center from 7 to 8 on April 12, 2017. Beautify DP is scheduled to be March 18th from 9 to 11 at, at the DP library. At San Marcos High School, March 15th and 16th is the ASB elections for the 2017 and 18 school year. Friday, March 17th is the musical marathon from 12.30 to 8 p.m. in the auditorium. The local, the vocal department will try and perform as many songs as possible in seven and a half hours. Classes will be able to sit and listen to, 
and listen from 12.30 to 3 p.m. After 3, the general public will be able to listen to a wide variety of songs. Saturday, March 18th at 9 a.m. until about 5 is the Royal Classic Track Meet. San Marcos will host a track invitational in War Workington Stadium. April 5th through 12th, the class officer election candidate signups take place for the 2017 and 2018 class officer positions. At Santa Barbara High School, March 17, 2017 is the Wall of Fame Assembly during fifth period in the theater open to all students. It will be honoring five successful alumni by inducting them to our Wall of Fame featured in the main hall to inspire our current students. The talent show is March 22, 2017 from 6 to 8 in the theater. There will be a VADA Spring Show on April 6, 2017 from 5 to 7, p to 7 p.m. in the cafeteria and there's a and there's a welcome meeting for new VADA fam families on April 11, 2017 from 6 to 8 in the cafeteria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brace. Yeah, as usual, there's a lot going on in our high schools. Um, and with that, we're going to move on to item C6, the superintendent's report. Do you have anything to share, Mr. Matsuoka? I do. Uh, last week, I attended for the first time the Santa Barbara Man of the Year and Woman of the Year Awards, and uh, it was great to see John Clark recognized from the Bauer Foundation. And he, he's, he, John's so humble, but also so inspiring. Uh, and it, just, it was really, it was neat to see him recognized by his community, by his peers, and uh, he's been a great supporter of our district. Uh, got to go with some of our colleagues, especially uh, um, through the PEAK program, which the Bauer Foundation supports. So, and what a beautiful spot. Is it the Coral, is it called the Coral Casino? Okay, I'm not in my last district anymore. <laughs> it was just a stunning luncheon. Uh, second, uh, Saturday I was invited to the Matt Academy, um, what is it, the annual um, gathering. And what struck me about that is Matt's been around for 20 years. I didn't know that it started in 1997. And I saw the history of it. It started in a little room and it's grown to this really incredible program. It was, it was helpful to see the community support around MAD. Um, so and it was held right across the street at the museum there. And it was also that night that I first heard the news um, about Connor O'Keefe. And it, that really impacted the MAD community. Um, I think we all know that Connor was a senior at Santa Barbara High School and passed away on Saturday. And so we put a lot of support in place at Santa Barbara High and I was really proud of the staff. and. Thankful for the outside support providers. Um, came to realize we have great mental health support communities. Um, they were on the ground uh, supporting kids, and supporting staff. Uh, it, was a, it was a hard day. And the follow-up continued today, I believe, and um, it's really hit the MAD Academy. He was a senior inside of there. And then the water polo community. Not just at Santa Barbara High, but it's impacted San Marcos, and also DP. So we have some uh, roads ahead for Santa Barbara High. They'll still need our support. So I would just ask us to make take a moment of silence in, in honor of Connor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. That brings us to item C7, um, the announcement of closed session action. And we don't have any action to report out. Um, and then there's board comments and correspondence. Board members, is there anything that you need to share or want to share from the past few weeks? Mrs. Moten? Yes, thank you. I had the, the good fortune to be um, invited to the move -a at Washington uh, Elementary, and I hadn't been there for years because my son attended there, and it was different than the jog -a I think they changed that to be more inclusive uh, for other kids to be able to have different uh, stations that they went to. There were music, there was basketball, they even actually have a mascot that wasn't there before. So it was just great to see them. The kids were really, really um, excited, and, uh, and it was just good to see 
the kids excited doing different things and really uh, being proud of, of their day and just made me feel really good about being there and knowing that our schools and that our kids are having a great environment. So thank you. Ms. Caps. Well, in a similar spirit, I uh, was happy to be able to read um, to the classroom at Roosevelt for Roosevelt Reads and in honor of Dr. Seuss's birthday and a lot of uh, other ele elementary schools were doing the same, but um, just the chance to do that and Supervisor Williams was there at the same time that I was. Um, we walked out of there and I thought, man, if you if you're, can't be put in a, boot, be a great mood after reading to a bunch of kids who are just eating up every word, uh, there's something wrong with you. So it was just a, a really nice thing and a great community event. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. That brings us to item C9, public comments on non-agenda matters within the jurisdiction of the Board of Education. Dr. Reed. We have three public comments tonight, and I'm going to read the three um, so that you can come up right after the other. We'll start with Na Kimbwala, then Carolyn Terraoka Brady, and then we will have Dr. Anthony Beebe. First of all, Madam President, um, Superintendent, so congratulations on the uh, initial first response to your crisis. I think you handled it well. Congratulations. Um, it is sad. I also want to say I'm grateful that you guys are recognizing that uh, National Autism Awareness Month and Cesar Chavez Day as well. Um, I'm a, I was a little bit disappointed my last time out because I didn't see the recognitions for Black History Month or Women's History Month coming up or an International Women's Day, so I'm a little confused about how that makes it or doesn't. Uh, however, if it pleases uh, Madam President and uh, Board Member Superintendent, I did want to recognize uh, three instru instrumental women in this district who have always showed the fidelity that uh, I would want my daughters and my son to aspire to, so if it's okay if uh, I can have them come up, Mr. Superintendent. Sure. Could I please have Sandra, Meg, and Helen come up? <laughs> they, they look very surprised. Uh, um, you know, Sandra has been a consummate professional from her days back in HR. Um, I was really pleased when I came back two weeks ago to see her get promoted up. Um, she's well worthy. She's the consummate professional, and I'm, I'm really excited about the direction of the district as, as a result. Uh, with respect to Meg, Meg has probably been the most longstanding <laughs> women cabinet member since before my time here. Uh, her work is always meticulous. She's always precise. It's always reliable. And in my uh, principalship, she was the only cabinet member who made it to my site in a, in a supportive, collaborative effort. So I'm grateful. And the last one again is uh, Helen. I've worked with Helen previously, probably almost 10 years I've known her. Um, Helen is like, I, I label her like a silent assassin. She's like a little pit bull. She'll get down on, on the details. She'll scour them. She'll go over them inside out. Um, but one thing is she never loses focus of uh, the, the intent, the needs, uh, the resources, the human resources, the fiscal resources. Um, you know, on a, on a personal note, I recluse myself from her interview just because I had written a personal letter of recommendation for her for this position. And um, it was based on the work that we had done together. And I'm very proud to see that she's been able to kind of steer uh, the needs of the district, especially in the tough part of special education. Um, so again, I would just want to encourage, seconds. thank you ma'am. Um, Madam President, I'm not going to ask for an extension today just because I know we still have some other speakers, but again, I, I do believe that, you know, we could also use that extra mm, 12 minutes or 11 minutes allotted for public comment for an extension. But again, I'd like to recognize these young ladies here, and uh, I, I hope that you continue to lean on them in their areas of expertise uh, as the district is facing all the challenges ahead of them. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Carolyn Tarek Brady. I've been in the district for a while, 30, tech, 30 years or so. Um, I'm here to really share with you the experiences that Alex Marquis, a senior at San Marcos High School, and Jack Nelson, who's a volleyball player and as a junior this year is not here. Uh, we all attended the American Choral Directors Association, that's my professional organization, and they offered this experience of a national honor choir. And uh, this year I wanted to share some statistics. 1,500 students in the United States auditioned. And um, let's see, from California, um, out of the group was uh, created a 300 voice group. 21 came from California, and the section Alex and Jack both are baritones or bass ones, and there were only four um, from California in that group. And I'm extremely proud of them. We just got back Sunday night and avoided the snow. I wanted Alex to share what he felt about working with Eric Whitaker. Yeah, so it was a very uh, special experience for me. This is my second National Honor Choir. So I came in expecting the same, more of the same thing. But um, I was really inspired to work with Eric Whitaker, especially because he not only is a conductor, which is what I wanted to possibly pursue in college, but he's also a composer, which was an arena of music that I had not even been opened up to. And uh, going to this conference, I was able to explore that area of music and now I'm debating with myself whether I want to pursue it. So it's really incredible to have this opportunity. And it was great to be with my friend Jack. He's a really good friend of mine. Uh, we definitely had a life-changing, maturing experience there. And uh, thank you. Just going to tag on a little bit to that. So the, within uh, four days, the group of 300 presented four pieces, and they sang it with the Minnesota Orchestra at Orchestra Hall. It's extremely technical music. You can go to YouTube and listen to Eric Whitaker talk about his um, talk in lectures at Oxford or Cambridge or his visual choir. It's just wonderful. And for me, professionally, it was a refreshing experience. I heard 42 choirs, 32 different countries represented there. There. I learned more about literacy and choral music and if this isn't the best time to be thinking about choral music and the experiences that we all have, learning different ethnic, ethnic music, um, acceptance, tolerance, it was all about hope and the future. And Eric did say about this group of 300 how bright they were and how fortunate he felt that with everyone's attention and tolerance and knowledge of what the world is, even with all that's going on, he felt very comfortable about the future. So thank you, Board. And thank you, and I'm so sorry Jack was not here because otherwise we probably would have requested a spontaneous baritone duet <laughs> <laughs> next time. Thank you. Anthony Beebe, President of Santa Barbara City College. I really don't have an agenda. I just wanted to stop in and, and visit for a second and, and let you know how much we appreciate the great work that you do and, and uh, also what a treat it's, it's been to get to know uh, Mr. Matsuki, Matsuoka and uh, spend some time with, with him. Uh, of course, we both started at the same time, so that's been kind of some kind of a bonding experience for us. Um, enjoyed that. But I also wanted to kind of highlight and acknowledge the great work that uh, we do uh, in terms of our partnerships. I mean, we have a dual enrollment program that is currently enrolling about 1,600 kids right now to get credit at Santa Barbara City College. And Ismail knows about this very well. Um, Credit at Santa Barbara City College that can be transferred anywhere in the world. I mean, with reputation of Santa Barbara City College, um, students can go anywhere they want. Uh, hopefully, when they graduate from Santa Barbara Unified School District, they will come to Santa Barbara City College and be with us. Um, but the nice part is, is they have the option to go anywhere. Um, the other thing is, is that we we started this last fall. The uh, College Promise Program, and I know you're familiar with that. We have 600 kids that are in the College Promise Program, which enables them to get free tuition, free books, free supplies uh, to go to Santa Barbara City College for two, two years. And uh, that, that really is getting national acclaim in terms of how we've set that up and how we've structured it. And I know we'll probably have some opportunities in the future to be able to, to have joint board meetings, meetings or whatever and be able to talk in more detail about that. But again, just wanted to say hello 
introduce myself and, and uh, thank you for all the great work that you do. Thank you, Dr. Beebe, and I also appreciate you coming and even just saying your name because like Mr. Matsuoka, your name is one where I look at it and go, I think it's probably Beebe, but I'm not positive. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the work that you do at City College and the incredible benefit as a parent who, um, through dual enrollment, you know, you've saved me a year, not a year, a semester's worth of four-year college tuition. Um, I just can't say enough about how it benefits every type of student in this community. Um, you know, while they're here and then beyond. So uh, thanks to everything that goes on at City College, we just have a tremendous opportunity here in this community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Uyoa. I just want to add one thing to uh, what Dr. Beebe said about the 600 students. Uh, yes, we got 600 students at SPCC to be part of the promise. Initially, we were only estimating about 350 students, so it, it's a great uh, boon to our community college to have all these students, and it just, um, just highlights what kind of programs we do have at CC that our students are able to do it uh, more readily through the promise. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Okay, this brings us to item D, A, acceptance of donations for March 14th, 2017. I mean, would accept with gratitude the donations. Second. Moved by Ms. Moten and seconded by Mr. Uyoa. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. And then that brings us to the consent agenda. Are there any items that need to be pulled? Ms. Moten? Uh, yes. Um, item four and item six. Just have some basic questions. Item four and, and six. Six. Um, do you want to talk about this at the end of the meeting? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Is there a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda? I move to approve the remainder of the consent consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Um, and we will come back to item E4 and E6 at the end of the meeting. Action agenda. We have a number of discipline cases coming up. First one is F1 board action on student discipline uh, case number 2016-17-29. In the case of number 2016-17-29, I move to accept the expulsion with enforcement suspended for one school year, which ends January 2018. Second. Moved by Dr. Reed and seconded by Mrs. Moten. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. And then board action on student discipline. This is case number 2016-17-31. In the case of 2016-17-31, I move to accept the stipulated agreement for full expulsion for one school year, which ends January 2018. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Board action on student discipline, case number 2016-17-33. In the case of 2016-17-33, I move to accept the full expulsion for one school year, which ends January 2018. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passed unanimously. Um, and this brings us to board action on student discipline, case number 2016-17-36. In the case of 2016-17-36, I move to accept the stipulated agreement for full expulsion for one school year, which ends January 2018. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that also passed unanimously. Um, F5, this is approval of the resolution 2016-17-31. Support of recognition of April as National Autism Awareness Month. And this is Ms. Rodriguez. As she's making her way up, can we uh, point out uh, there was a person inside the personnel report who is in our audience. And I would like uh, Dr. Ramirez to just make some brief comments about our new hire. <laughs> Is there another working mic over there? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. Uh, board, uh, it, one of one of um, 
recently we we made the uh, the offer and and was accepted to have a an English language development uh, teacher on special assignment. She's uh, she's here with us. She's currently at uh, teaching fourth grade at uh, at Roosevelt, uh, and that's uh, Miss Hortensia Corral. Mm. And um, and we're, we're just really excited to have her as part of the team. Uh, she will she will actually not begin until this coming year. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we we support her through the transition. But um, it's it's uh, it's a role that's much needed, and we're very excited to have her as part of our our team. Absolutely, I was excited to see that on the on the uh, action form. Well, and she's an she's an alum of our of our school, so <laughs> yes. school together. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Board President Kate Parker, Board Members, Superintendent uh, Matsuoka, and Cabinet Members. Uh, it is a pleasure to stand before you. April is National Autism Awareness, Awareness Month, and it gives me great pleasure to bring resolution number 2016-2017-31 to the Board for approval. Autism disorders, uh, spectrum disorder, and autism are both general terms for a group of complex disorders of the brain development. Um, these disorders are characterized at various degrees by difficulties in social interaction, verbal um, and nonverbal communication, and repetitive behavior. Um, normally, the signs of autism begins at the age of two and three. ASD can be associated with intellectual disability, difficulties in motor coordination, as well as attention and physical health issues. For over a quarter of a century, many organizations, including Autism Society of America and Autism Speaks, have worked diligently to promote autism awareness. This resolution shows that Santa Barbara Unified School District Board <coughs> is in support of this event. Thank you very much. Board members, you've had a chance to look at the resolution, um, and I will particularly note that at this time, we are serving 176 students with autism in the district, identified. Um, do you have any uh, wordsmithing, uh, any comments to share? It is traditional for us to pass this um, before April. Dr. Reed. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think it's an important resolution and thank you for bringing it forward. And I was just curious if you could share some of your plans, if you know currently, um, with bringing community awareness around this. So it, it, you mentioned in the document that you're going to be bringing community awareness and um, to different school sites and if there's something already in the docket that's on the plan for this. Uh, normally in our district we have a disability awareness where we have community members that uh, work with the site administrators and presenting to children on different disabilities and one is autism. Also we have a newsletter that we create on a quarterly basis. Uh, the spring newsletter that the special ed will produce will have a write up on autism and uh, those are the two ways that we would provide community awareness. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I do need a motion to approve this resolution, 2016-17-31. So I move to approve resolution number 2016-2017-31. And I second. All right, all those in favor of passing this resolution to support April as National Autism Awareness Month, please say aye. 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 And that passes unanimously, thank you. Thank you. And item F6 is the approval of resolution 2016-17-32, proclaiming Santa Barbara Unified School District's recognition of Cesar Chavez Day. And that is Mr. Matsuoka. I actually am learning some parts of Cesar Chavez's life from this resolution that I, I wasn't aware of. When you look at how many schools he attended, that's a lot of schools, 37. Um, in light of what our country's going through right now, especially in California with our high Latino population and our workforce in California that is very much centered around agriculture, this is a really important resolution. Um, 
it's too bad it falls during spring break. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually the Friday of our spring break, so we'll encourage our staff to consider the right time to just, you know, it's up to our teachers done, uh, to bring this to the awareness of our students. But this was a civil rights leader in our local state and was a great man. And I think his work is needed more today than ever. So I'm glad that we are bringing this forward for your consideration. Any comments on this resolution? You've had a chance to read it, Dr. Reed? I'm just gonna say I'm all about these resolutions tonight, so <laughs> thank you. I think this is great, and um, I look forward to learning maybe perhaps what the teachers might be implementing, certain activities that they might be doing, and maybe they can share them with the board so that we can see that the, it's actually happening and what is happening across the district. So thank you very much for bringing that forward. Yes, EDCO does ask um, districts to have specific activities around this. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. That was moved by Ms. Sims Moten and seconded by Mr. Uyoa. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Wow, which brings us to item F7, approval of general conditions and supplementary conditions for contractor construction for multi-prime contracts. It says Ms. Chate, but I see Mr. Hetyank coming up. Thank you, Mr. Matsuoka, board members. Our construction contracts have four main parts. We have our plans, our specifications, what's called our front end documents, which is project specific information filled out by the contractor when they submit their bids, including lists of subcontractors and the amount of their bid. Uh, the real meat and potatoes of a contract to, on how it's administered is the general conditions. Our general conditions are geared toward non multi-prime projects where we have a general contractor, be it a former lease lease back or a design bid build traditional delivery method. Our lease lease back delivery method has enough changes in it where we felt it was prudent to come back to the board and have them approve a second set of general conditions specific to multi-prime projects. Uh, the supplementary conditions were used in the past to update the general conditions so we could just bring the supplementary conditions to the board and not the the large document. Uh, the large document was last reviewed in 2015 and approved by the board and that's why there's no current supplementary conditions because we didn't have to update anything until now. So we're asking for your approval uh, for the general conditions and the supplementary conditions which will be part of our construction contracts for Peabody Stadium. Thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? Ms. Sims Moten? <laughs> She's, I'm just going to look puzzled there for a moment. Do you think about that? The yes. only thing I say is, would say that it didn't come, this is a final version. It hadn't come before this board before, right? Was it before the previous board? It, uh, the final version of the, the general conditions was last approved by the Board of Education in 2015. We've been using that version, but since this is our first multi prime construction delivery method contract, uh, we want to approve general conditions for this type of project. And can you just tell me what multi-prime, what do you mean okay. by that? In a, in a traditional design bid build environment, we, a general contractor will bid our project and give us a price for that project. And as part of his bid, he includes all of his subcontractors, all of their licenses and information about them. In a multi-prime delivery method, we pretty much eliminate the general contractor and have the construction manager serve in that capacity. So now the district is gonna have 20 some contracts with what used to be subcontractors in the traditional method and they're now referred to as multi-prime contractors because they're all in a prime position. They're not working for a general contractor. They are all working directly for the school district. So is that for efficiency? Uh, in a project such as this, it, it hopefully will be more efficient and more cost effective. That is the goal. Dr. Reed? Well, I'm for more cost effective, so <laughs> so good. We'll look forward to seeing the results of that. 
Um, I did appreciate that um, I was looking through it's it's very detailed it's contract language um, and your uh, information your background information made it clear that we've had legal counsel uh, working on this um, so uh, I was comfortable with that I did catch a typo on page 60 of 74 <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> yes it's just super minor but I was like wow I I, I I read this. <laughs> you did. <laughs> wow. I acknowledge you for that. And I, I, yeah, I, I need some. Uh, and it's, I'm sure it's in the red line section, or uh, no, it would be in the in the the new section. So was that blue in this document? 16. It's on, uh, uh, so, and sorry, the, that's the issue with PDFs, right? That they come across uh, with different page numbers. But you know what? It's so minor, Mr. Hetyonk, that I'm just going to email it to you. Email it to me, and I'll make yeah. the changes before we put it in the final version. I'd be more than happy to. Great. And any other comments? Um, I do need a motion to approve these general conditions and supplementary conditions. I so move. Second. Moved by Mr. Uyoa, seconded by Ms. Sims Moten. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move on, I have a question for the board because we've had a board transition. We did educate the prior board about uh, we had some moves away from program management to using construction management firms. We defined all these terms like uh, general contractor approach. It's really how do you deliver a project? Multiple prime, lease, lease back. And I'm listening up here and going, oh man, I, I wonder if you have the background to understand this. And we actually could just pull up a board report, I think it was October, and just re-agendize it just so that you have some of the technical background. I'm, I'm seeing some head nods, so why don't we do that? Because you're going to see many, many contracts come to you over the next five years, six mm -hmm. years. It's just, and at first, we'll go a little slower so that you can ask your questions about the structure of these. Uh, multiple prime does save us money. It also helps us get projects done at a better t um, time frame. But all of that, we, we explained it, so we'll bring that back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hetyonk. <coughs> all right. Item F8, approval of new classified job descriptions, family engagement liaison, district level one and two. Mr. Torino. Good evening, President Parker, school board members, Superintendent Matsuoka, and cabinet. I uh, bring before you uh, just some classified, new classified job descriptions. These are uh, family engagement liaisons at a district level one and two. They will directly support the implementation of the district's family engagement objectives. Both positions will report directly to uh, the Director of English Learner and Parent Engagement Programs. Um, I would answer any questions if you have them regarding the job descriptions and or the approval. Mr. Uyoa? Um, I know that there's a similar, I always forget the name, similar position at Santa Barbara Junior. Yeah, so some school sites are secondary, mm -hmm. have a similar position. Mm -hmm. What this is going to be focused on is helping our elementary mm -hmm. schools have that same type of support. Okay, I was just wondering if it was the same position. Yes. Okay. Ms. Sims Moten? So tonight you're just asking us to approve the job description, Correct. right? So what's the next step after that? The next step will be to post these positions. Uh, we actually might have some site level people who are currently working in secondary who might apply for these positions, but then they will, it's kind of like what we look at as a, a, um, a pathway for some of our folks in the secondary to become a district level person to work with our elementary. So we'll post, um, get candidates, interview, and move forward. Ms. Capps. Educational question of, of, I know there's so much focus on trying to engage families more, and how, how many engagement liaisons would you say there are? Currently? Yeah, in the district. I think there's one at each secondary, so that would be seven. That's great. Great. Thanks. So I'll note that funding for this is from um, federal Title I funds and then some LCAP funding as well. Um, yes. Uh, course, when we're talking about budget cuts um, to the general fund, essentially, uh, coming up, we'll be talking about the, in the report discussion agenda. Um, 
And so I just want to be really clear that this is essentially restricted funds Correct. that are targeted for this kind of thing. And I, I think my only question mark would be that as we move forward with this, you know, what, there's going to be trade-offs in that budget as well. Yes. Um, and so what are what are the trades that we'll be making with it? I hope that that will be clear um, as the LCAP comes forward. Um, and, and you know, I wish that we could fund everything, but uh, I know that this has been a priority. So thank you. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any further questions, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, moved by Ms. Sims-Moten and seconded by Mr. Uyoa to approve the new classified job descriptions for family engagement liaison districts level one and two. All those in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. and that Aye. passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we now have F9, positive certification of second interim financial report for fiscal year 2016-17. Ms. Chate. Thank you, board members. Welcome to your second interim, 2016. This is the second one you've been able to see since you've been appointed, become board members of the Santa Barbara Unified. Um, Staff has prepared the 2016-17 second interim for the board's review and approval. Um, all assumptions um, throughout this document have been um, accumulated from SSC, FICMAT, and the governor's budget. And I'd like to just go briefly through this and at any time feel free to stop me with any questions that you have. We have a slight increase, we're on page two, Brian, um, from the LCFF funding because on the governor's budget in January he upped the um, COLA, uh, the GAP funding just a little bit for about $124,000. Slight increase to other revenue and uh, local revenue. Then in the unrestricted expenditures we had some uh, slight increases and then we had some increases in books and supplies of 651,000. That was um, parcel tax that had not been budgeted at first interim and we have budgeted them now and that is mostly in instruction and in equipment technology. We also had a major reduction in um, services of other operating expenditures. Staff and I went through the service budget and lowered a lot of um, expenditures that had been budgeted but had not come even close to where they would have, uh, they should be if they were going to spend it all. So we reduced those items. The overall net effect on that on page three was the result of operations and we went down from 6.5 to 5.77 and that is about $748,000. Um, of that, almost 5.8 million, 3.2 is due to the one-time mandated spend down that we're doing um, in 16-17 or we've budgeted to do. Page four. We're on the restricted side of the budget and there were some slight increases in revenue but the largest one was in our local revenue which is mostly due to our donation accounts on our site sides. Um, when they get any kind of money from foundations or anything we put that in a restricted side of the budget because it's not for us to, to use, it's for the sites. And um, then we have the corresponding expenditures with them. So if the revenue goes up, the sites know that they can spend it, so they budget to spend it. We have a, um, on the restricted side of, you can see that the contribution, our local contribution, went down by about th almost $400,000, and that is due to um, not filling some positions, mostly in special ed, but not lack of trying to fill special ed positions. <laughs> On page seven is uh, just another way of looking at our ending fund balance and as you can see the dark purple is our unrestricted ending fund balance and you can see that declining and that's, you know, a lot of it is due to the spending down of one-time funds. Now we're on the components of unrestricted fund balance of the um, 
Ending fund balance, the differences between first interim and second interim, I explained um, earlier about the six, going from 6.5 to 5.6. And as I said, this is mainly due to the services that we reduced um, in the prior page. And, um, you know, every time we have millions of people look through this document and check it, and as I'm going through this, I found that we didn't put the 3% reserve in line down here at 4.8 million on the first interim. The second interim, it should be 4.8803391. And that leaves us an undesignated, unassigned uh, $1.1 million. So then we go into Fund 17. Uh, not much change there, but we did book our interest and we expect to have about $30,000 worth of interest on Fund 17. I want to move to page 12. This kind of this chart um, shows the results of the governor's budget assumptions for the current year and the two subsequent years. As you can see on 16-17, our first interim was 54.18 percent, and it went to 55.28 percent, and that's the gap funding. And I just want to remind you what the gap funding is. We have a target amount for 2021, and we had a floor in 12. Uh, 2012-13. Uh, so the gap between that, that's what they call the gap funding, and every year we're funded more and more on the gap, so or we are paid down on the gap. So the gap gets smaller and smaller as you reach the target area. So the amount we started out with in the gap funding was like 30 million. We're down to maybe 6 million. So 50% of 30 million was a lot. 50% of 6 million is not so much. So um, that was the increase of the $124,000 that I spoke of on the, um, the gap funding for the first, to the first interim to the second interim in 1617. 1718, uh, first interim, they were projecting the gap funding to be 72.99%. It dropped to 23.67%, uh, like a 50% um, percent drop. So that, equated to 1.9, almost $2 million worth of loss of funding in that. And then in 1819, the gap was increased a little bit, but um, it didn't amount to very much because of our declining enrollment. Can I just ask on this chart, sure. Mr. T, do you think that there's a chance that that will change in May? Here's hoping. <laughs> um, I, I, everything says that it should change. The LAO, um, you know, all the, all the signs are there for it to change. So I'm hoping that it will change, but my gut feeling tells me it's not going to come back and gap, and gap funding, which means we'll be kind of on schedule for L the LCFF. I think it'll come in one time. But if it does come in one time, I think we should, you know, I think we're planning to use that uh, to help with us uh, to smooth out the amount that we need to reduce. Ms. Moten. So on page 13, so this deficit of 1.974, which I'm assuming is correlating with a few thousand dollars to the 1972 up top, mm -hmm. is that the same that was reported in the first interim where we had a gap about 2.5 2 million in budget and now we've reduced this or is it just two different things? Okay, so let me explain this because what what we have to do is prove that we can make this year 3% and two fiscal uh, fiscal years out. And so when I do the multi-year projections, I go through the whole process, all the ins and outs, and I come down and I say, we don't have any money in the unrestricted general fund. So I say, okay, we need to put 1.9 million in there. And so I have put that in the expenditures, I have reduced the revenue by the 1.9. I have put those 1.9 expenditures in the salaries on line nine or eight. And this is just an informational piece that um, tells you what I needed to do to get us where we needed to go. Now, first interim, it was 2.5. Cabinet has worked together to reduce the 1617 budget by almost a um, million dollars in the services, and I'll show you this on the next page. So maybe we need to. Um, but before I move there, so the 2.5, mm -hmm. 
the 2.5 was our, de our budget deficit, right? Well, it, was, first in, yes, it was where we needed to get to to cut for re reductions in the budget. Okay. But the 1.9 and 2.5, they're two different they're things, right? They're two separate right? things. We okay. have basically solved the 2.5. We're about, about $200,000 short. But we have basically solved that. And then we got hit by the 1.9. So we have that to look forward to to resolve that. And the 1.9 is relative to the gap with the governor's budget. That's correct. So there's two different things. So is there a way to make that a little bit more clear? Because cause the reality, what I looked at is that we have to get 2.5 billion cuts. And so when I looked at this and saw 1.9, I said, okay, we're down. So we're still moving down that piece. And then later on, we looked at some further reductions that we'll be talking about today. So when in fact, it wasn't the same thing that we're looking at. Yeah, we got hit kind of with two things. We got okay. with we we solved one issue and got punched with something else that we need to take care of. Okay. But I will I will think about how I'm going to explain that better, and maybe that line will all disappear because it will be in the narrative. So okay. maybe we'll just make that disappear. Okay. Thank you. So the next page. Can I, can I ask one oh, question? Sure. But so is that 1.9 embedded in the numbers? in up above? Yes, I, um, I have put the 1.9 of reductions in the salaries on the multi-year projections in the SAC software. So I had to do something to make sure that we got a 3% reserve at the end because it's all calculation. It won't let you send the file, blah, blah, blah. So I do embed it in the salaries on line eight. And the same with the two million down on 1819. And that's to cover the governor's gap piece, right? So is this a double entry at the bottom? You've already showed it up top, and then at the bottom. This is an informational piece. Okay. This so just says, hey, this is what I did to get us to where we need to go. It's not another, it's not an additional 1.9 to what I put into line 8. Okay. It is an informational piece. Okay, because that part wasn't clear. So okay. if that's going to be there, then maybe the narrative or the notation needs to make that clear, what you had to do to make that entry. But okay. otherwise, it's not clear. Okay, so. I think um, I think we would like to remove that line and explain it better in the narrative. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not till the next page, Mr. Tay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I put in a little information about the governor's budget. Um, and for everyone that hasn't been through a full budget cycle, what happens is the governor comes out mid-January and says, this is what I think is going to happen. And so we react to that because we have to. That's the only information that we have. And then on May 20th, we're all, we'll be de going and hearing what he has done um, what adjustments he has done. And so that's when I'm hoping that we'll see something change uh, regarding that 1.9 million. And then there's the final budget which he has to adopt by June 15, which there can be movement between May 20th and, or the May revise and his final budget. So it's a moving target. The budget is a live document. It, it, it's, it's living and moving. So there's some just informational. Um, the assumptions, as I mentioned, were um, all from, you know, SSC, the governor's budget, and FICMAT. Um, we adjusted it by the COLA increases and the gap increases. We increased the PERS and STIRS. Um, and we made the final adjustments for 17, 18 on um, page 15, at the bottom of page 15. You'll see the reduction in services of 2016, and then you'll see the reductions um, in 17, 18. And these two numbers add up to about 2.3 million, and they are in the second interim. And so that's where I say that we kind of solve the 2.3. But then with the governor's um, gap funding, we, we lost another 1.9. And then the last charts are just to show you the increase of PERS and STRS and revenue t um, our revenue in compared to our STRS um, cost, which is a standard chart we always put in. I, I just want to focus on this for a moment. I mean, we, we we talk about this all the time, but I really feel like um, 
we as a district, our staff, um, and the general public have not fully grasped this. Um, and when I, when I look at this, you know, and, and the amount that we're contributing to pension costs that we, uh, it, the way it's escalating and the way it is essentially not being matched by money from the state, I mean, those are raises that could have gone to, to employees, but instead will go to cover their pension. I mean, and, and I don't know that there's a pretty way of, of fixing this because if the district weren't paying it, then the employees would be, need to be paying it directly. Uh, or taxpayers in general would need to be paying it directly or we would need to change the way STRS is set up. Um, but I, it's, it's mind-boggling to me where we're going with this. And I, I know that it's hitting what we could do for employees on, with raises. And I just, I, I feel like we, we don't get that message across. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And this isn't just PERS. This is combined PERS and STRS. Hmm. I, I have no solution to this problem but to budget for it and plan for it. And I put it in here every time because I do feel it's, it's one of our, uh, it's, it's everybody's big problem in the whole state of California. Everybody I talk to, this is the number one, special ed and number one. Um, and and um, PERS are number PERS and STRS contributions are are up there. Um, this is it's it's really hard on districts. Right. And so I guess for general public that might be watching this, um, STRS is our certificated staff, and, and PERS is our our classified staff. That's their correct. retirements. But it, what it feels like is that we're heading towards a system where we're only paying for future retirement and not able to fund cost of living increases for people that are working right now. Um, um, and that's a huge dilemma. And it's hard to convince the younger staff that this is a really super great benefit because they're young, you know, and as they, as we all get older, we're like, you know, thank God, goodness, we have a pension. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, they always ask you what keeps you up at night. This is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. How, how are we going to continually to fund this? And, and when is the state you know, it, Governor Brown gave us some of that one-time mandate and said that we could use it for, to help fund our STRS and PERS. Well, you know, when you have instructional materials and technology to fund and all these other things, this is, this is, this is not going to help educate children, right? Um, you know, we need these other instruments, so. Is there a way to show on this chart the increases per year and are there percentage of increase per year? Yep. Okay, is it something you could come back with? I already have a chart on that. Oh, okay. So you, can you either email it to us or, mm -hmm. okay. Because we're dealing with this at the county as well. But it was easier to be able to see that, that percentage of increase um, each year and to look at, have real numbers to it without going, Marines plus. We used to put it in there and now we went to this because we thought it was simpler. But if you would like to see yeah, the I just whole. think it just okay. really puts a real number there. I mean, you, you've got to add here. But you, you know, you'd be able to say what is 752 going to 8, what that percentage is and what mm -hmm. that real number is. And sometimes that's a real, you know, eye opener, you know, and people start thinking creatively how we're going to work it out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, do you approve my <laughs> 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 If you have finished explaining the narrative, Mr. Taylor, are there any questions that we haven't brought up yet on this? No. Okay. All right, then we do need to uh, approve this. One question I have is I assume that you'll fix that one chart before this goes to the county, the, the one where you missed the- Oh, yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reserve line. Okay. And, and one more thing, will you be taking that line out before you submit it to the county, the 1.9 in the, the bottom line here on the, your projections? It's on page 12, I believe. Um, I, I have, whatever goes to the board has to, they want to see what we sent to the board. So I, I'll have a conversation with them. With them. I'm sure they'll be calling and finding out what we're going to do with the, about, about the 1.9. Okay, so but is that in your narrative already? And it seems like it's duplicate in this report. So have you explained that already in the narrative? Because it is confusing. Oh, you, you mean your, about the the reductions? Yes. Yes, I w don't. I'll talk to them about that. If they're confused, they'll call me. Okay. Yep, because you actually yes, do mention it in the fund balance. 
in your narrative of the fund balance. Mm -hmm. Okay, I move approval. <laughs> 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 I second. Thank you very much. All right, moved by Ms. Hinsbowden and seconded by Ms. Caps. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the action agenda, and if the board would allow me to, I'm going to call a very brief recess, and we'll um, take a break and come back for the report discussion agenda in less than five minutes. And we will continue on with the agenda, moving on to item G1. This is the enrollment projection study update. Um, California Demographic Services, Mr. Matsuoka. And we have Dr. Lanny Ebenstein in the audience. He's here to answer any questions about the report. Uh, I'm going to focus on the high level, I would say, interpretation of what Lanny's presented to us. Uh, the timing of this couldn't be more <laughs> important in light of staffing, in light of our budget challenges. Uh, I'm really thankful that Lanny was able to turn this around uh, and produce this. So, there is a narrative where I captured, you know, it, it's really, this is at three layers. You've got the long report, it's about 40 or 50 pages. You've got the executive summary that is just the most important highlights, and now the slide deck to walk us through. And I would say, please ask questions, ask what about, what ifs. And so, um, Big picture observations, we have now entered a period of declining enrollment. It showed up in the elementary school data. I, you know, I wasn't here last spring. We opened school, we just, we simply opened school. And now as we look back, we did have some decline. And what caused that is the 08 recession. That birth rate, it's almost like a perfect inflection point. Prior to 08, families felt good. And so the birth rate was, I would say, healthy, normal. And then the 08 recession hit, and you know, a lot of young families said, I'm not sure about our economic situation. And since then, I mean, that was a decline. Um, we'll get to that slide, but the local birth rate changed dramatically since 08. And because kindergartners are five years old when they come to us, there's a delay effect. It's five years down the road. So we are now, feeling the impact of the birth rate decline caused by the Great Recession. Um, the impact is first being felt in our elementary schools. You'll see that in some of the data sets. And then we'll move into our junior high over time and then eventually to our senior high. The good news is the birth rate in 2016 has started to rebound. I don't know if you saw that little inflection point. So big picture over you know, 8, 10, 12 years, don't overreact. Don't sell schools. Don't close schools because this stuff's going to come back. And y some of you have been around a long time. Um, DP apparently at one time was, you know, on in discussion about closing, and then here we are, DP's 2,100 kids. Um, so th these come in cycles. Some of our staff is smiling. And so here's the birth rate data. That's a decline of almost 13%. Uh, that's a that's a big drop, and it is literally showing up in our kindergarten enrollment trends. Uh, TK actually masked that a little bit. Lanny explained that very nicely, mm -hmm. but I I appreciated him separating out the the two cohorts, like with TK, without TK, and the TK actually did mask it a little bit, but now it's all hitting. And so the, the decline is already started to arrive. It arrived in what we would call the 15-16 school year last year. It arrived this year again. Um, and, and I just projected from 2015 through 2021 uh, a decline of 843 students in our elementary enrollment. Uh, that's a decline of 14% over six years. And for most of you as board members, you're brand new to this space. That is a really dramatic change in a school district's enrollment. I mean, if it changes 1% a year, that's actually significant. For it to change that much, um, that's, that's a big adjustment for us. 
And then, so just locally, the 1516th last year was minus 97. That, that's based on actual data, CBEDS data. And then this year we were down 147 kids ver against the prior year. So over the last two school years, uh, we've declined 244 students. Um, that's, that's a lot of students. Uh, if you think about our smallest elementaries like Cleveland and Harding, they're in the, about the 350 range. I mean, you're starting to get into the territory of the size of some of our smaller schools. So our staffing has to match our enrollment. As it declines, we've got to be really accurate with our projections. Uh, we've built some, some really great systems. Um, we meet every Wednesday to monitor enrollment in real time out of Aries. And we're especially watching the kindergarten enrollment because it's new parents, they have to fill out paperwork, come on, get your stuff in. Um, I think our kindergarten enrollment will still grow by about another, I'm watching Fran, about another 100, maybe 75 to 100, yeah, between now and when we're ready to finally decide to staff schools. Am I pushing the right button? You can just push it. So then junior high should hold steady through 2021. Actually, I was, I, was, I was surprised when we were looking at the staffing of junior high. It's actually going up this year for next fall. So I had, I had to do some math adjustments in my head, um, which is always good. Um, but then the decline starts to show up um, around 2021. And then senior high. Um, we're going to have a one-year decline next year, um, minus 147, and then relatively stable for about four years, and then a seven-period year of decline through 2030. And a loss of 1,000 high school kids, roughly, over that time. That's almost 16%. So our comprehensive high schools, they average around 2,100 students. Uh, on average, they're going to drop down to about 1,800 students. Um, by the way, 1,800 is still a really good, great, I think it's an ideal size for a high school. It's big enough for your master schedule to flow, but it's not so big that, you know, kids are getting lost in the cracks. Um, I don't think that's a dramatic enough drop that we have to do anything, you know, big at our high schools. We just have to really monitor the staffing as we watch those numbers decline. Oh, it's your, your clicker. So what are the implications? Accurate staffing is absolutely crucial. If we staff to last year's numbers every year, we're going to be overstaffed by, you know, one to one and a half percent. And, you know, given the second interim, given the budget, the last item, we've, we, we've got to staff accurately. So we commented about our systems. Um, you know, we are asking ourselves uh, as staff and listening, uh, what will be the impact of the immigration narrative in our country, and especially locally in Santa Barbara, to our enrollment numbers? And we are worried that some of our families are going to leave this summer because they just don't want to deal with the uncertainty of having a family divided. And we've talked lightly as a leadership team about how do we monitor that when we don't really have a way to monitor it. Um, but we, you know, we've got some initial ideas. We've got to have at least feelers out in the community where if we start hearing about families leaving, we just have to have, have, to have enough sense on the ground um, to monitor staffing and enrollment. So we're going to, I think we're, we're going to staff tight this spring. Um, the challenge if you staff too tight and then have to hire teachers in summer, I mean, that's not the best time to hire. So it's really, it's finding that right balance. And I think that's, is that our last slide? That's our last slide. So I'm sure you have comments and questions. Yeah, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Matsuoka, for moving forward and, and making sure that we had a report like this, mm -hmm. so that we had data to really work from to understand the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge Dr. Lanny Evanstein. Did I say that right? No. 
No, I didn't. <laughs> Dr. Evenstein. Evenstein. <laughs> okay. But the bottom line is, um, and I read the whole thing, I want you to know. It was really well written and it really explained, it was really great to get the history of where we are and then um, I remember I was just sitting there thinking, wow, this is really interesting, the history piece, but also where we're going and why. So. Um, I think it really makes sense for us to have this information and now to really look at our systems as to how we're going to make it so that we can fit with these trends and keep our district, you know, moving forward in a positive way. So I just wanted to make those comments. Mrs. Houghton? I just had a question as to how um, the enrollment has the impact on our average daily attendance. Does that have some impact there? dollars so if the enrollment is going down so that hasn't uh, that has an impact on the ADA so is that is is that is this information reflected in the uh, interim report on the I'm sorry this uh, the sheet here <laughs> yeah don't hello yeah <laughs> It is, um, it is for the 17-18 uh, year and the 18-19. Uh, those are my enrollment projections. Um, when when we get into adopted budget, we're going to have a discussion about the the, the um, information that we have from Lanny, what we have that people have been already enrolled, get <laughs> children enrolled, and take it from there. Okay, great, thank you. Ms. Caps. Yes, um, I think we're all. Uh, concerned about the potential impact of immigration policy, a world that I work in. I just wondered, I mean, this is all so confusing f for everyone. Uh, if you all feel like, or could we be doing more in terms of um, assisting staff with the right information as it exists currently so that those who are especially interfacing with families on a regular basis can p potentially alleviate any fears? I don't, not falsely, but I, d mm -hmm. I just wonder what kind of materials or should we be seeking them? Maybe this is something I can work on, but mm -hmm. to try to make sure that staff who are seeing families every day and might know which ones are particularly nervous right now and uh, are at least have at least have contact with legal services or the right type of services and if there's a role that we can be playing. I don't know who that question is directed towards, but I guess you. Well, I'll take a first uh, pass at response. Uh, I am seeing out in the community some organiz organized efforts to yeah. inform, support our Latino families. Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Uoa and I will be on a panel a week from Friday. Um, and it really is a community-wide panel. Um, I think there's like 10 different organizations being uh, asked to comment about questions. They're gonna ask us specifically about, you know, schools mm -hmm. and what if ICE comes to a school. And um, we actually have some resources identified. I, it's time for me to do some reading and some writing. And to your point, we do need to get some, you know, big picture guidance out to our schools. Um, a lot of this is out in the community. Um, I've not, just not had a chance to connect with uh, Chief Lunhow. I, I think Santa Barbara PD and Santa Barbara Unified, uh, we just need to be c communicating and collaborating um, because there's just a lot of misinformation out there. Dr. Reed. Yeah, I'm wondering um, with this, with our new family engagement liaisons or with the program that we have in terms of family engagement that we might have more discussions around this or opportunities for discussions so that we can alleviate the, the challenges that might be facing these parents. So it might be part of the dialoguing that goes on in, in perhaps in one of these um, family engagement nights that we have. So anyway, I'm just thinking we have these liaisons potentially being hired, but we already have a family engagement policy in place and it might be something that we could sort of make an embed in part of that program to, to have an opportunity for these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. If I could, uh, of course the mic's not going to work for me, <laughs> work for everyone else. Uh, we have been approached by a number of community-based organizations um, 
and actually, um, you know, really the the role that we can fill beyond what you're talking about is providing spaces, and so many of of our CBOs are involved in in um, educating families, and so um, uh, civic use uh, is one area where we can help out because we do have the spaces, and we we are doing that um, Franklin, in fact, at uh, Franklin Elementary, um, there's uh, an organization that's doing an uh, uh, information session for families on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, not being hosted by us, but they're using our space. Just, yes. uh, just if I can, uh, I, again, I do this in my day job, but the UC system, which has a lot of resources, are, are handing out cards to everybody. They have immigration centers. It's sort of a know your rights card. I think that City College is doing, has done that, right? So I just, it sounds like it's happening and I'm not, there's no um, criticism here by any means, but just to, uh, an encouragement to be as proactive as possible and to seek, uh, I mean, just uh, again, judging from our the resolution that we all passed in December and the support that this board has uh, for immigrants who are our student body, so we just want to really be as supportive as possible to and be there, proactive. There has been a, a, a folder compiled for resources that all of our leaders in the district have access to, Great. and it's a, a shared folder, and so, in fact, I just got um, some more information saying, can you drop this in the folder? So, uh, Good. so we're trying to get that out there. Great. Um, could you pull up the the larger document, the one that's called uh, the en Enrollment Report Projections Final? On the uh, yeah, um, I also really appreciated this. I, I I I love the historical context. A lot of the documents that uh, Dr. Evenstein referred to are ones that I've had to kind of find over the years and read separately, and they're fascinating. And it's nice to have a summary in one place. Um, and uh, and also just to see how uh, the demographics of the district have changed over the years. I mean, I, I went back and I read some of the early reports in the 1970s about the you know how unbalanced the schools were, and, and I was like, wow, little do they know those were the halcyon days of balanced schools, and they didn't you know you know the, the demogra dem demographics have changed so much, but also just the overall picture of Santa Barbara as a community, um, which is. Um, you know, very much skewed, uh, uh, both uh, older and younger, but really more older. Um, and to have that summarized, I think that would be, a, uh, this would be a great document to share with the City Council, for example, mm -hmm. as they're thinking about what plans they have in place and what kind of community we want to be able to support as a whole, um, because it, it has to be more than just the schools that are doing it. Um, I had some questions that I think are from Ms. Wagonick. Are you still Miss Wagonick? Doctor. Uh, has it happened? Yes. Is oh, it official? Yes. Okay. Yes. Dr. Wagonick. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the first time I've referred to you that way. <laughs> um, that, uh, first of all, do we have more inter-district transfer requests than we are granting at this point? Because we had a pretty tight cap on the number that we would allow in. Um, is that, do we have more requests than we have spaces? Is that something we should be looking at? Um, I believe last year we eliminated the cap. Okay. So um, the question would be, you know, we can, um, we can take as many as are requested unless there is no space availability at that school. So in terms of secondary, it's not really an issue, but it's not yeah. All right. So, and, and the reality is, is that the same decline that's hitting us is hitting the entire region. So it's not like um, uh, that would be changing dramatically. Um, Another thing that came up for me in looking at it was the the uh, number of students that feed into our secondary system from private schools, and how helpful it would be to kind of be able to track that more closely. Um, I have thought for a while that we should probably be coding students as they come in from, so that we know what specific school they're coming from. I don't know that that is currently the way Aries is set up, or if we just take them as a new student. 
Um, it's not currently set up that way. This microphone. Yeah, work. you can shout. Uh, <laughs> shout for the public. My assistant principal voice. Um, I fully believe that Mr. Rouse and I can work on creating that and making that available. Yeah, because that could provide us all sorts of data. I mean, I'm sure that I, 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 I kind of know in the background that local day schools have had declines in enrollment. Um, and that would also affect our secondary schools ultimately. Um, and it helps us keep track of trends and what, what parents are looking for um, and, and uh, when and why they make some decisions about where they enroll their students. Um, we have a long-term um, goal in the strategic plan of aligning some of our feeder patterns um, between elementary, junior high, and high school. And that's been kind of in the works for a while. Um, looking at the decline in enrollment, it seems to me that it would, it's showing that there would be capacity to make minor changes in, in, um, in boundaries, essentially. Um, and so I hope that that's something that we can, that we can take a look at um, as soon and hopefully get done. Um, and then what else did I have on my list? Oh, I know, uh, page 12 of this document. Um, because I have a feeling that this will be used uh, in the future, where it says it's important to note that out migration in SVSU elementary school is the last uh, part of that paragraph. It says in 1910, the SBSD thought its elementary area could become a basic aid district. Um, and then it, it proved not to be accurate since the elementary area did not become a basic aid district. I would like to get that corrected because we did become basic aid. I think it might have been two, Michete, three? It was until the unified piece went through. And we went unified for one half a second in, in uh, 10, 11, 12. Okay. So we were basic aid for two years, is that right? Basic aid for two years in the elementary. Okay. And then one year for a hot second in... Um, As a unified district. Unified. So three years total. Okay. Um, that's it, but I, I thought it was a really helpful report, and um, uh, both in the current context and historical context as we think about the future. So any other comments or questions on that? Um, and I'm sure we will be using it very practically in the uh, uh, coming months. So thank you. The one comment I didn't put into a slide um, I was wondering about our facility master plan and was there going to be any implications from this? And given the, I mean, there's changes, but nothing so dramatic that we should adjust our master facility plan. I mean, I actually, you know, looked at every school, looked at the enrollment. Uh, I don't see any adjustments. The, the one thing that I will keep in mind is as our high schools drift down to 1800, whatever housing pressure we have will start to alleviate just because of these trends. So we'll keep that in mind. It actually might let us be more creative with our facility bond dollars because we're not going to be in such a crunch. But we do have to be prepared for 2031, 32 and yes. down the road. <laughs> yes, yes. Previous boards, decades past, have learned some bitter lessons as, uh, as Dr. Evenstein made so clear in this report. All right, um, let's move on to item G2, discussion of school safety plans, and that's Dr. Wagenek. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. Ms. Parker, Mr. Matsuoka, board, cabinet. I am here uh, to bring to you information or a report on our school safety plans. I'll be uh, giving you general information tonight and then on um, April 4th, uh, bringing the, all of the plans forward for your approval. So, uh, California Education Code actually requires the um, 
review and, and uh, completion of an annual comprehensive school safety plan in all public schools in the state. Um, what this requires is an assessment of um, school crime uh, and then, uh, and you know, I do have to say there's some terminology that the state of California uses still and we'll, I'll point those out and they're probably obvious when we come to them. Um, it's not really, yes, they are crimes in the true sense, but it's really, um, you know, the, the, the safety status of the school. So assessing that and then assessing what they are doing uh, as a school in terms of the strategies and programs to address safety. Um, I really look at this as, you know, two of our priorities, which is evaluation of our work and improving our practices. And so um, doing the assessment is the evaluation of, of our work, how are things going, and then improving our practice, practices is the um, assessment of the, uh, the strategies and programs. Uh, these are uh, Generally, uh, an administrator will take a first cut at the review and then um, the, either the school site council or a safety planning committee will come together at a site and review the plan, make suggestions, give input, and then ultimately the school site council is required to sign off on each of the plans. In addition, within our um, Within our state, it's required that law enforcement be consulted. In, in our district, we also um, request that each of the schools have law enforcement actually sign off on the plan um, and um, be part of, of the feedback process on, in the schools. So the, uh, the, the state requires that there are certain components, um, again, the assessment of the current status of, of safety at the school. Uh, schools have to also t uh, notify the policies around suspension and expulsion. In our state, uh, teachers uh, are given notice when there are dangerous pupils uh, on their in their classrooms and um, this is an area that goes back to have some earlier earlier times of zero tolerance that we're moving away from um, the ed code actually says that that law enforcement and the courts are to be notifying us of every single felony and misdemeanor committed by uh, students and that we are to notify teachers of that. Um, that is a state policy, but I'll tell you that in fact it does not happen. However, any time that we are um, we are notified that a student has committed a, a dangerous crime, then teachers are notified, and those are uh, contained in the plans. The process for that. Uh, school wide dress code is in there. Gang related apparel. It's a very nebulous sort of term, but uh, that is that is in there. And so we have school dress code. Um, there has to be safe ing ingress and egress, which is basically parents, here's where you drop kids off in the morning, and you'll see, especially the elementary schools. In fact, I wish the high schools had have more safe ingress and egress because, uh, but, uh, but it's just how do you come on to and leave school. Uh, it has to address how the school focuses on the safe and orderly environment, um, the procedures for school discipline, and then um, Identifying appropriate strategies and programs to maintain school safety. That, that's really about addressing that assessment piece of, of the safety of the school. But it also uh, addresses certain specific things as required by the, uh, by the state. That assessment of current status, um, in our district, this is really what uh, administrators and the safety committees or the school site council look at. Uh, some of the same data that we use for the single plan, for the LCAP, and that's attendance, suspensions, results from Healthy Kids Survey, et cetera. So really, the, 
the best way for you to see how this plays out is to look at an exemplar. Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Some of the formatting of a Google Doc into a PDF gets a little wonky, so I apologize for that. It will be uh, it will be correct when it goes up on the website, and I should let you know that that. Um, all of our safety plans go up on the district website each year after they're approved. So the exemplar is Harding uh, University Partnership School. And I need, I need that. Am I able to scroll down, Brian? Uh, Will you just do it for me? Thank you. Uh, so we'll just scroll through very quickly. Um, the required, if we go back to the required um, components, um, the first is the ad assessment of the school. No, I meant, I was saying that. You. you can stay on the plan. Thank you. Uh, if we go to page three of the plan, Okay. So at Harding, this is their assessment of, of their data and looking at, at the safety. So they actually looked at their suspension rate and they decided that that was an area that they were going to focus on. They, as you can see, um, they wanted to lower their suspension and expulsion and so they adopted restorative approaches and a specific curriculum called Mind Up. Go ahead and go to uh, page nine, Brian, if you could. Okay. Uh, or not, maybe it's page 10. Suspension and expulsion of, okay, it's numbering differently on here. This is very wonky. <laughs> so, go back to the beginning. And I'll quickly just take you through here. So you can see that, um, and I know you've had a, a chance to look at this already, um, all of those components, the required components are contained in this plan. If we go on through, go to the next page, Brian, thank you. Um, they've identified their goals and that's really what stood out for me when I looked at this plan is, is they saw their issue, they identified goals, um, they looked at more survey data, keep going Brian, thank you. Um, it, here's their child abuse reporting, their disaster response procedures, what happens in case of an earthquake, so that's one re uh, requirement. Um, emergency response plan. Stop here. Section two, procedures for level one lockdown inside. So that's another important piece and if you watched key news at noon today or you watch it at 11 o'clock tonight because I know you weren't available for six o'clock, Washington had a lockdown today. And I want to formally um, let the board and cabinet know what a fantastic job that Ms. Lockridge did and her entire school did. They actually saw um, two individuals running through the campus, called 911, immediately called a lockdown. Those uh, students were in lockdown for half an hour. Hmm. And then they were in what's called um, kind of a stay put situation where they could be in the room but me be moving around. So um, I sat with the kindergartners for a little bit afterwards. They got a long recess after they were out, but they were they were essentially locked down for 45 minutes today. Um, but they did a fantastic job and that's because they practiced. So these, uh, these plans will have um, the procedures for the lockdowns. Good timing. 
going through. They have um, their command system there. Keep scrolling. Keep going. Keep going. So this is all their does that, and then here's their suspension and expulsion policies. Go up. Um, here's where they're addressing discipline in their school. So these are their agreements that they've set out, and they have, this is part of their mind up curriculum. So that's laid out in the plan, what the expectations are. Go ahead and scroll up. Um, here's the procedure for notifying teachers about the dangerous pupils I talked about earlier. Keep going. Here is notification of a student who's been suspended. So teachers um, are to be notified every time their student has been suspended. I remember I'm, back when I was in school, it was always fun to see if you could see the attendance list because if a kid was suspended, then it said SUSP next to their name. So you knew who'd been suspended. We don't do that anymore. Teachers actually, through Aries, they get a little asterisk next to the name, and that's what it means. So that's how they can find out if they want more information. They can go into Aries, and they can see what code the student was suspended for, but they cannot see the details of the, of the case. Go on up, Brian. Go on. Keep going, we covered that already. We have the sexual harassment policy. There's also a bullying policy in here. Here's the dress code with the board policy. Keep going, Brian. Um, and then finally, the procedures for safe ingress and egress from school. And if you scroll up, we've got their crisis response routes that are in there. And some, um, and then they actually have in included their intensive plan for how they have a safe and orderly environment. And what I like in this plan is that they've really involved their parents. So they talk about their ELAC. They talk about parent leadership. They focus on how having parents um, as part of the school creates a more orderly and safe school environment. Going on up, they talk about their partnership with UCSB. Keep going, Brian. Thank you. Student recognition. Keep going. They talk about their emergency drills. And we will end there. This was not an ideal layout, so. Um, but I know you had an opportunity to look at it. So I, so I think I will stop here and let you ask questions. Anything that uh, you want to know about the safety plans? Comments or questions on this? Ms. Sims Moten? I just have a comment. I appreciate the, the level of detail in terms of that. And I see the basic, what has to be in every plan, but then there are specifics to this actual school environment. So I really appreciate that detail. It actually uh, gives me ideas what to do to my own emergency report at the county. <laughs> so thank you. OK. Great. Um, I'll just add that there, there are pieces of this that should not be on the internet, though, that maybe it's on the intranet, but not on the internet, and it's pieces like the map of the school, the routes that you'd take in an emergency, um, what you would hear on the intercom um, if somebody was calling level one or level two, because unfortunately, um, bad people will look this up and can completely plan around ways to target a school if they have that kind of information. And so I want to be really cautious that if there is something that is specific to, and, and you know, I've I don't know if you've ever been to any of the presentations that some local terrorism experts have given on this, but they say that um, uh, there have been cases where they have found on laptops in foreign countries maps of certain schools in the United States, things like that. So we have to be really cautious about it. So I would suggest that anything that is um, that could assist somebody with uh, bad intentions, that that is like in an appendix or something that's at the end that does not get posted to the internet, um, okay. that is um, kept. Uh, Away and, from and that. there's actually, uh, and I have 
read that same information yeah. and viewed it, but there's actually two sides to that, which is if, um, if there's an issue and someone needs to access it, so we've talked to law enforcement, if they need to access it via the internet, where do they get it? Mm -hmm. So we go both ways, but yeah, definitely there are things Something that need to, to be pulled out before it goes on. All right, so I guess the question is, I mean, typically in March, we would see all of these at once. They're very similar. Um, and will we be seeing these at the April meeting for action? April 4th meeting. The April 4th meeting mm -hmm. for action. Um, and so you'll see you're, you're going to get a, a lot of them all at once. And uh, there are fortunately, you know, there's, there's a pattern to them um, and there's a template to it. So it's not overwhelming to take a look through. Um, but just be aware that that will be on for action in April. Okay, thank, thank you. you. This brings us to D3, update of general obligation bond measures I 2016 and J 2016, Mr. Tay. As Mr. Tay walks forward, I'm, I'm wondering about how to structure the safety plans. It's 17 or 18 of them. I think 17 to 18 individual items is a lot. We, we um, always bring them forward for one group. One, one group. Okay. Yeah, 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 unless there's... Okay, Yeah, that's helpful. <coughs> Good evening. So on uh, February 23rd, I went up to San, Fran San Francisco and interviewed our underwriters, um, five of them. Um, and we, the underwriters are the people who sell our bonds. So we interviewed five underwriter companies and we chose um, Morgan Stanley. And um, they've been in constant communication with us ever since, which is good. And on the next day, Carrie joined me and we were interviewed by Standard & Poor's and Moody's. And basically what they do is they ask us a lot of questions to see how stable our district is in and the direction our district's going to go. And um, then they make a decision whether they want to upgrade us or have a better FICA score, as I mentioned in here, or if they're going to remain the same. And Moody's increased us from a AA2 to a, or a AA3 to a AA2, which is really good. So it, it has um, better buying power for the, uh, or better interest rate. And then um, Standard & Poor's kept us at a AA. And Carrie and I were a little disappointed by that, but really a double A is not that bad. Um, but we just, we wanted to achieve greater. So, but that didn't happen, but maybe next time. So um, what's next? So on March 20th at two o'clock, I have a pricing call with Morgan Stanley, our bond counsel, our financial advisor, and a whole slew of people to say, what's the market doing? How's it do, um, how's, how are other bonds being sold? What's the interest rates, what they're going for? And then the following day at 9 a.m. our time, this is all happening New York time, um, they start selling our bonds. They already have the um, purchase agreement out there in the POS and a lot of people are showing interest. And so um, they put that out as a little teaser and then said, okay, we're gonna sell on the 21st. So after that happens, um, we should get, um, I was told that we we're gonna get our money April 4th, but um, Bond Council wants three weeks to review everything. And so that puts us at about April 11th. I just found that out just about an hour before we got here. So we should have money in the bank by no later than April 11th. It was good news. Any questions? Dr. Reed? I just have a, so rating AA, I mean, what's better than that? So <laughs> what is, is AAA. it AAA? Okay, so AAA is the best. Yep. Okay. Ms. Smoten? Yes, so the two and the three, is it lower the number the closer you get to the AAA? That's right. Okay. I once had a needle and then the numbers were going higher and I thought there's going to be this huge needle. And in fact, it's just the higher the number, the smaller the part. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A little different than needles. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, um, I'll just say that I know that we would will be hearing about it at our April fourth meeting. I'm sure, but uh, you know, we're excited to move forward with this and um, get going with the work that our community has uh, approved for us to do. So that's correct. That's great news. So thank you. Thank you. Item D four. Professional Learning Overview. Ms. Carey. Good from here. Okay. We're still teaching her. I, <laughs> I already sent George an apology email that I was caught unawares at the moment of her introduction. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with my newness. Um, so, um, good evening. President Parker and members of the board and Mr. Matsuoka and cabinet um, and audience. This is a, just an overview of uh, the professional learning scene in SBUSD. Um, and I'll just say right away from the title slide that you'll notice a lot of connections between the content that I'm going to present and um, Dr. Ramirez's presentation on instructional uh, materials. And actually, I predict you'll see a lot of overlap um, with Mr. Rickman's presentation that follows mine, which is I think a really good sign. I mean, there there should be really there should be a lot of interconnectedness between um, how we are continuing to sustain the learning of our professional workforce, uh, the materials that they use, and any um, any technology that they would use. So, uh, note that, look for that. I, I think that that will come through. Let's, do I do that? Oh. oh. Okay, I did that there. There we go. All right. So, for example, uh, Exhibit A. This looks very similar to a slide that Dr. Ramirez already shared with you. Um, I do just want to expand on on some of these things. Uh, he laid out the timeline really well, uh, and people can see there just just the magnitude of the um, of the shifts uh, in content and, and curriculum. Uh, across really all core four disciplines. Uh, if I were to elaborate on that, I would say that, as you know, in mathematics, that didn't just mean new standards for us. It also meant an entirely new way of approaching math curriculum through integrated math courses. Um, we were just in a meeting today. We we're still kind of wrestling with what that means up at, up at the junior and senior year of high schools um, and the different uh, outcomes from the integrated math sequence. Uh, the next generation science standards um, aren't just new standards, but we had to go through a discernment process about whether to adopt a four course or three course model, for example, in, in the high schools. Um, and so that is really, uh, some of these shifts are, are much bigger than what you would, what the, just simply the title would suggest. Um, the implications at the elementary level for NGSS have uh, really deep uh, overlap with literacy and ELA and ELD standards and framework. Um, and the history of social studies framework is most recent. Our social studies Tosa just walked back into the room here. Um, so she's been instrumental in helping to relate to our social studies teachers that there is, um, while there haven't been dramatic shifts in content for social studies framework, that there are, uh, there's a real emphasis on how we deliver that content. Um, something that, that wasn't, um, as much of a focus in the realm of instructional materials as it is for professional learning are all of the other initiatives and efforts that don't have to do or that, that happen above and beyond just these ado the adoption of these new uh, frameworks and standards. For example, you heard recently about the CTAG grant and really the renewed emphasis on career technical ed. Um, in a 21st century iteration of career technical ed uh, technology, and I won't steal Mr. Rickman's thunder, but I, I know it's not any surprise to anyone that um, technology has always been a core part of instruction. Um, even since the days when some of us were students, there's funny stories to tell about that, but that the pace of change where technology is concerned is, is undeniable. Um, student engagement is a really broad term that refers to things that we've been talking about and some of that preliminary information around attendance, um, social emotional well-being, um, but also just to refer back briefly to Dr. Wagner's pr uh, presentation on school safety. Um, in the realm of professional learning, what that really means the most is training on restorative approaches, um, and especially lately, how to welcome back students and reintegrate students after there's been um, a disruption to the learning space. It says equity there. I, really, I feel like it really should say cultural proficiency, because the professional the learning is around uh, cultural proficiency and becoming a more culturally proficient workforce um, and having our school communities become more culturally proficient so that equity can be achieved. 
it's just equity is shorter. <laughs> Fit on the slide better. So uh, that would be what I would say for that, that slide. Oh, then I do this. There we go. So again, you know, using this phrase of, of 21st century learning and design, I'm just going to uh, actually just read here that understanding and implementing transformative changes requires a teacher workforce with a flexible mindset and adaptive practices. Very similar wording to what we talk about with instructional materials. I really like in this second bullet this this idea of the the word uh, using the word curating, thinking of teachers as curators of um, not just whatever materials or technologies or devices might be in a room, but actually of students' experiences. Curating of other people's experiences. We just had a conversation today about sort of the unsung creativity of our teachers. Um, that, that effective classroom teaching is a highly creative endeavor, even though it's not often thought of in that way. Um, and so that is, it requires a real delicate balance, because it isn't to say that we don't need, in fact, in, as I think President Parker pointed out recently, um, we, we most certainly need, and we know that we need, really high quality instruction materials. Um, and not to depend solely on, on teacher creativity um, to provide those high quality materials, but but there is a balance. I mean, really high quality materials in the hands of a, of a, of a teacher who's not dynamic and flexible and has a growth mindset about their own learning don't go very far, um, and certainly teachers who, who have that dynamism can do a lot more when they don't have to worry about generating some of just the sort of foundational materials associated with the content of their discipline. Um, so those things go hand in hand, and like I, like I said, there's that, there's that delicate balance. Um, and above all else, we, we know that teachers do best. There's lots of research. I don't know how familiar you would be with it, but um, lots of research that the most, you know, the largest effect size on student learning um, of all the different things things that we try in, in educational systems is really having teachers work in teacher teams, collaborating on what student data tells them in order to refine their practice in an ongoing way. So those are the things that I think are some of the basic tenets of how we approach uh, designing professional learning for our teacher workforce. Um, our <laughs> Our teacher, uh, our professional learning experiences currently, I would characterize them as highly varied, um, both vertically and horizontally. <laughs> Um, and that has, that's a, just a really, I think, just authentic way to describe what it means to kind of reckon with the massive shifts that have taken place. Um, and in the absence of a lot of sort of externally kind of arrived at supports. Uh, be they in the form of materials or even in the form of training. Um, and so that's, that's can be, th that can feel a little disorienting for people, but I also think it's a wonderful opportunity because what it allows us to do is um, have experiences that we recognize that resonate as really high quality and then seek to replicate them. Um, and those ring really true for our teachers. And so it becomes really clear, and you'll see me uh, talk about this later, um, the teacher's voice about what's working for them, what's meeting their needs, um, what we need more of in order to meet their needs you know, really does come through um, with those kinds of experiences. So as even though it's, it's highly varied, both you know, from TK to 12 and, and even across school sites in the same grade band, this is a very oversimplified graphic just to try to capture what has been, I think, a really undeniable shift from what would be the left side of this graph, you know, what we sort of have traditionally thought of when you think just in any industry, maybe professional learning. Oh, I go to conferences, I get training, or I hear speakers, things like that, all of which are, are valuable. Um, those things are not bad. We need those things. We, won't, we don't want to be insular. But that there has been a shift from uh, using a model that is more exclusively external, which characterized our professional learning for many years in this dist district, and like I said, in most industries probably, to uh, internal, internal forms of professional learning and they take both uh, centralized and, and decentralized formats. Um, I think this is just another slide where the phrase delicate balance would come up, you know, sensitive to the fact that, again, we don't want to be insular, um, but we also know and I might invite you to think about um, just in your own experiences as a learner, you know, sort of that truism of you remember 10% of what you read, but 90% of what you teach, you know, and some 40% of what you do or whatever. So the more invested you are in kind of um, making meaning of the learning that you are experiencing, um, the more impactful it can be. Um, but again, 
infusing ourselves with, with the expertise that we can avail ourselves of. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this slide, or it turned out to be interesting for me, as I, as I contemplated these different modalities of professional learning and, and looked at the budget numbers that you provided, which were also very simplified, um, that it roughly broke out into, into thirds. You know, what we're currently investing in what I might call the infrastructure professional learning, and those are the, um, you know, sort of uh, paying our, our teacher leaders, our teachers on special assignments, sometimes it's administrators, sometimes it's just, you know, directly compensating teachers themselves, um, uh, and the external forms of professional development. Um, I found that just interesting that those are sort of rough thirds. Uh, I have lots of examples of what, um, uh, examples of external and internal uh, professional learning. I'll just cite some, and if you have questions, you can feel free to ask for more. Um, but what I could generalize is that the, the forms that external professional learning are taking um, are typically areas we can turn to outside entities that have the capacity, either the technical expertise, um, or an um, some cases just access to resources that we don't directly have. So examples you might be familiar with would be um, like equal opportunity schools who really did through their our cons consultation with them helped us to kickstart a movement toward greater access and equity for under traditionally underrepresented students in, in college level classes. So we've learned a lot through that partnership and the gathering of the right kinds of information in order to act and make real changes for access. Um, when it says effective instructional practice, we know they're really um, proven methods uh, from pedag improving pedagogy, whether it's AVID strategies or integrated ELD through GLAD. Um, ex internal examples, uh, these are sort of countless and and varied. Um, I've been able to witness many of many more of these in the last seven or eight weeks than I had as a as a high school principal. Um, and these are uh, uh, there's some really powerful ad artifacts I could share if you're interested. Um, for example, just last Monday, uh, physics teachers in our district actually getting together, observing a class at one school and then meeting for the rest of the day to kind of deconstruct what they observed through a kind of critical friends type of protocol. Um, teachers get together and score common formative assessments and writing to see what, you know, against a rubric to see, okay, what is it that our students are, are seeming to master more easily? What is it that needs more attention and reteaching? So lots of examples of that. Um, finally, I would just say that, uh, I would just, I guess, underscore that it's really important for us to be listening to our students, um, whether they know they're talking to us or not. Sometimes they are overtly talking to us, but through whatever data and information um, we get from our students in order to respond to their needs. Um, and also to listen to our teachers. Um, our teachers are the, are the ones who have the highest impact in the experiences of our students. And that relates to the second bullet, which is really one of the threads that I see emerging most frequently um, is a continued, it says the need there, but really more accurately be sort of the continued and ongoing need for us to connect those dots between what students need, whether they say it explicitly or not, but what, but we, what we know as those who are re the responsible stewards of the educational outcomes in our district, um, what those students' needs are and how we can continue to educate, sensitize, and capacity, you know, build capacity in our teacher workforce to meet those needs, um, and and just aligned with um, one, you know, one of our three district priorities. I do see a real need for us to develop more systematized evaluation of the professional learning that we engage in. So that would be a goal for the future. Yeah. Are there any questions? <laughs> Board members. Um, this is a great overview of, of how we're going to do it moving forward. Although the, um, it's such an interesting tension between external and internal, and I don't know, it was, it was interesting to hear, because um, I, I didn't necessarily get it from the graphics, that, it w that it's about a third the way that splits up. Um, but uh, what I, w I would love to see, um, uh, like the funding attached to this, is that 
is that on a like when you're looking at it are you looking at it over like a three-year period when you're thinking about professional funding for professional development is it just like year to year how does that work so I think one of the attachments is that is included is a budget overview which would show you this year and next year. So it, really that was what we looked at and, and looked at any, there aren't significant shifts, um, excepting the, num paying you know the salaries for that additional student free day in 17, 18. You know, having the two this year and the three next year, that's a significant shift. Oh, that third one. Can we pull that one up, the mm -hmm. projected budget? So for 1819, those extra student free days go away, correct? Right. The agreement extends through 1718. Mm -hmm. I'm also kind of surprised at the 107,000 for summer personal um, professional learning. Is that just for the one week? Is that for st for teacher salary, or it doesn't it's include like any any? It does. It includes a whole, it ho so a whole package. A lot of these things have a lot more detail <laughs> if you look at them at a granular level. Mm -hmm. So the bulk of that would be what happens in that week immediately following school graduation, although I would say that the thinking around that and our uh, approach for this summer, um, it, we intend to shift that a little bit. I think we did a really great job, a very well-intentioned job of making sure we had meaningful offerings for all types of teachers um, in all niches. Um, and what we've been talking about very recently is kind of a return to some key high impact um, trainings for, for groups of teachers, uh, particularly those who are in the midst of adopting you know, major, uh, implementing major curricular shifts and building from there and continuing to include something that we piloted last year, which is teacher directed professional learning. So within some constraints of where and when and how and with what accountability measure, allowing teachers to kind of submit proposals for time for them to work, as I said in that one slide, with one another on the things that they know they need to give some attention to. It's one of the real challenges of professional learning is um, capturing teachers during the school year without doing so at the expense of their students who, you know, and, and that's another place where there's that delicate balance. We, we professional learning is too important not to do because we need to put subs in classrooms to do that, but we know that it's not ideal to put subs in classrooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, board members, can I ask, have, have you been onto the district intranet at this point? Since you're looking at me with the puzzle, I'm going to go with no. Um, because one of the things that has um, come up in the past, um, so, and I hope that, um, I think that probably all of you would like this as well, is that typically board members are invited to participate in professional learning. Um, and so, for example, we would get a notification that the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the week of uh, professional development, the week after uh, school gets out, you know, we would be invited and we could sign up to go to a session or, or, or let whoever was in charge, in this case it would be Ms. Carey, um, for secondary, for example, that we were going to go to a particular session. Um, that signups for those are all done on the district intranet. And so since we are so rarely on, I, I do go on occasionally, um, but uh, I think new board members probably didn't even really know it existed. Um, uh, and so we don't think to go on and, and try to figure out how we could sign up for something, especially because a lot of that is tied to payment and we aren't getting paid for it. Um, so I think that I just want to be sure that we have that on the radar because even during the um, during the school year when there are certain um, special trainings going on, for example, for a big curricular adoption, something like that. Um, it's something that's really helpful for board members to sit in on and learn about in a more in-depth way. And I think we have a lot of interested people that might be able to take the time to at least spend a morning doing that. Um, so I just want to be sure that we're, mm -hmm. that you think about um, including, including us when possible. Absolutely. We can definitely yeah. make that communication more explicit. Yeah. Our, yes, Dr. Reed. So, um, you know, in our interim budget, we had um, the line item 16. Is that, um, is this, so these numbers are a little different than 
what is proposed for um, for the budget. Back on, sorry. <laughs> Let's see what's on page. It's on this page 16? It's on, our, it's on our projected budget, which is on page 13. Page 13. So we have here, what is it, three? I'm just, if you could scroll down a little bit. So three, three million nine eighty eight one hundred. So is that where it goes in the uh, line 16 for budget for future years? In the assigned budget for future years? Right. So we're actually um, utilizing almost four million of that six million two twenty four. Is that correct? Hmm. I hesitate to respond just because I don't have that right. in front of me. Oh, but okay. Ms. Ms. Jate, the question is, so you've got that line <coughs> 16, it's assigned budget. I'm pretty sure that this, all of this PD budget is inside of the assigned budget for future years. And is there any in the books and supplies line or operations line? The, if you're talking about the professional development that's being funded out of the one-time mandated money, mm -hmm. it's in line... Um, 16. 16? Mm -hmm. So I guess I was just noticing that we actually have a positive difference between mm -hmm. what we have in the budget and what you've projected for education. So there's, a, uh, I guess, a difference of what, 969, 143. Right, so you, we also need to um, keep in mind that there's a presentation or an aftermind that might have <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and also we are imminently uh, on the cusp of adopting formally math materials with a projection to adopt ELA for elementary soon soon on the heels of that. So that's a that's a bucket, a bit a, a look and a sizable bucket. I know how it reflects right there. Um, it's really it's made up of this um, it, the, it's called the Educated Effectiveness Grant. It's mandate money, the one time money that is meant to be the spirit of that money is this is how we want to support districts with a lot of latitude around instructional materials, technology, and training. Um, and so that's the that's why those three legs of the stool are so interconnected and they do relate to that that I'm Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Martin. And I could this is we're coming up to speed so E O S T I P A R V Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah. What does that mean? Right. So EOS is the one I referenced earlier, the, the consultant that, and noted, I, I'll note that for future more presentations. So um, Innovate Ed, for example, that's a great example of an external firm that has helped us, uh, been a consultant to us for systems leadership, developing coherence around our school initiatives, actually developing the capacity of school leadership teams around strategic focus along a kind of inquiry-based model. EOS is what I was uh, re referencing earlier, Equal Opportunity Schools, who helped us identify missing students in our APIB and dual enrollment classes. TIP is teacher induction program, so currently we pay the county, um, but we are in the process of applying to be our own provider of teacher induction, which would defray costs. Um, so we are optimistic about that. I'm just looking at Mr. Tarina. I, I think um, we know, I think we know what IEE is, Institute for Educa uh, Ex Educational Equity, Equity and Education, and CMC's California Math Conference is just a big annual conference that we uh, tend to take advantage of. Anything else I can decode? Well, I was just saying, <laughs> yes, if we maybe do a budget somewhere where you could decode it there, I mean, so then it, it relates to this to this particular piece. So, but with regard to the tip, where you're saying 423.5, that's a big swing between 288, so what's happening there between 16 and 17, I think, and 17, 18? So again, currently we contract out that program, oversight over teacher induction, to the county ed office. Okay. And that's coming back inside. We're hoping to bring it for the first time in-house. Okay. And as a result of that, that's why that, that cost Correct. is going down. Okay. Thank you. We are working. I will just say that um, it's been a... It's been a labor of love for me, new in the position, to actually develop budget uh, documents that can be uh, that can be highly transparent and not need the you know a lot of decoding the way this one does. We I would say we don't have that yet, but they're very much in process. I just think the decode is going to come because we just don't know. Right. So initially, so you know, that's I hear where it's coming from. So <laughs> next year, I'll know what that means. Right. So <laughs> I should have been more sensitive to that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. If there are no other comments or questions. Thank you. Before you move on, I will comment about why at 
the last board meeting and then tonight you have two reports. So it was professional development and then the technology device and then the last one was instructional materials. We're really trying to give you the background around the assigned budget numbers that are for this year, next year, and the year after. It's, it really is the three large buckets of instructional materials, professional development, and devices. There's probably a few other you know, small dollar items, but that's the, those are the big investments. And we need to protect those investments because we need to keep investing in our, our teachers. And we also need to invest in our classified staff. We've got some plans in place to you know, look at paraeducator training and, and such. So that's the big picture. OK, this brings us. Can I, so I see two audiences. I see our OAS community. And they're probably waiting for the very last item, which is the $2.5 oh, million. Sure. Dollar we can plan. move that, can move that mm -hmm. one forward, because um, I see them. and. Uh, that one's, I think, relatively short, so why don't we move to that one. So, Brian, if you could queue up the slide deck. All right, we will jump to item G8, and this is the complete plan to close the $2.5 million budget gap for 2017-18. So, you see the narrative history about the, we identified the problem that, I'm looking at Ms. Jate, was that? First interim, so that was your first board meeting. Welcome to your new role. We have to close a $2.5 million problem. And then <laughs> Valentine's Day, I remember that night, um, we brought you about, it was about two thirds of the problem was, was framed up. And so now tonight, we're bringing you a complete plan and solution. And the, the strategies have shifted a, a bit um, but some of the foundations are still in place. And so next slide. Um, I'm just going to inter interject this. Th this report that we've received about the declining enrollment is both important to be proactive about, but also an experience to take advantage of on, on the budget side. It's that, it's that dynamic of we are funded based on last year's enrollment to get paid based on last year's higher enrollment. So if we can keep getting our staffing right, it's, it, there, there's just that difference of we got last year's money to pay for this year's slightly lower staffing. That's going to help us. It's just we got to be careful about finding that right spot. So that's helpful. Next slide. So the strategies, and some of them we adjusted. Um, we did put the gate coordinator back in because it was it was a really minor change. So we'll keep our elementary and secondary gate coordinators in place. So from the prior strategies from February 14th, it uh, recalibrated at 556,000. Um, uh, to give you one example of a line item, when we're going through the services and operations budget, you know, it's, we're not looking at it every cabinet meeting, but when we have time, we dig in again, and we found a phone system saving of $246,000. That's a big number. I was, I was really glad Mr. Rickman found that one. Secondary staffing, we, we actually have softened uh, the goal here. It was six uh, FTE reduction. Um, in light of our junior highs actually growing a bit, um, there's a little bit of savings in our secondary, our high schools. Um, we're going to drop that down to just four FTE reductions. Um, now, that's 20 sections. Remember, we talked about one teacher, FTE, teaches five periods, junior high and high school. So we're, we're working with our principals to find 20 sections. We'll get there. Um, it's it's going to take work, but it's not overly aggressive. The new one that, that Literally, I was updating this like four times as Dr. Ebenstein and I were trading data back and forth. Um, and, and I put into the more detailed notes, pure, on a pure mathematical calculation, you, we could reduce almost 13 elementary teachers just because of the enrollment drop. The thing is, they don't all come in groups of 24s and 32s at our schools. You know, one school's got... 12 kids over, and, and so we're trying to figure out half of that savings, and even then, it's going to take some work, but I think we can reduce our elementary staffing to seven. Now, that's gone up since 
February 14th. But that's because the enrollment data has really pointed out to us our elementary enrollment is, is declining. So we need to take advantage of it's not the right word, but just to staff smart to the decline. So every teacher ballpark is about $80,000 of costs. So one FTE saves you $80,000. Seven teachers, $560,000. So, in the narrative, there's a subtotal. At this point, we're at uh, 1.682, which is about where we were on February 14th. So, how do we close the last piece? Next slide. All right, these numbers are um, probably slightly off from the second interim. So, but just in terms of the ballpark, these three. Um, big buckets in 2017-18, um, it adds up to $35.7 million. Books and supplies, services and operations is a big one. And then some of that assigned budget for future years. But those three reports are going to use up that money. But if you just collect all that money together, the next slide. So the gap that we've got to close is $818,000. It represents 2.3% of that big sum. So what I'm saying to you tonight is we will close that gap. And I mean, probably every week or every other week, we're just going into the budgets. We're looking at that. It's like, oh, we're not spending that. Or we're not spending all of that, and it's just going to We'll keep cleaning it up till we get to June, and we'll close the books. And next year, we'll have the $2.5 million problem solved. This is, um, it's really the, the two big things, our staffing, getting our staffing right, and then using these monies efficiently. Those are the two big strategies to close the $2.5 million gap. And I believe that's it. And I'll. I'll let me make some comments to our OAS community because I, I need to come out and meet with you. I, I drive by La Colina and I think I need to meet with the staff. Um, uh, we're, we're monitoring the enrollment of all nine of our elementary schools every Wednesday. Um, I need to bring the OAS enrollment to the staff and have a conversation about staffing for OAS. And I've been meaning to come by the office I, I'm I'm just gonna commit. It's kind of it's not awkward to do this publicly, but <laughs> after I listen to the parent input about so where are we gonna send a second grader, like all the way up to Mr. Ortiz's office. I mean, after I listen to that, I, and I think the staff could kind of tell that's where I was gonna gonna go. So I've actually captured in the budget um, restoring the office manager position. Okay, so Miss Sandoval. You can count on being at OAS next year. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's important because the thought of a little second grader opening the gate and wandering up the school that you know we just need to keep our OAS students in the OAS place. Okay. So that that is one restoration. It's actually been modified in the budget. Mm -hmm. So the OAS reduction includes restoring the office manager position. As far as the staffing, it really is a function of en enrollment. Okay, so uh, we're actually monitoring. We want to watch the whole system. And then I need to come out and meet with the OAS staff. And then we'll bring some, um, I think, pretty final recommendations to the board for your review and consideration, either April 4th, but more likely April 25th, so just so we can watch enrollment. Okay. okay? So any questions? Comments, questions? I just, think it's, I just think it's a great that you are reinstating the office manager. I mean, I, I used to teach elementary, and you know, it's just crazy. You've got to have someone there to field it and to have to send someone off somewhere else. So um, anyway, I think it's a good move. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Moten? And just a comment, I appreciate the staff and cabinet um, making concerted efforts to look at find those savings and, and mm -hmm. so that we could close that gap and not have that be a worry and move forward to do that. So thank you. Um, 
I look at it. I, I wish um, that all budgets could be fixed by this way. You know, like we're going to go into details on the operations side um, uh, and and essentially clean out things that historically we're not spending, or um, you know, have Mr. Rickman look for utility savings. <laughs> um, because obviously in a budget our size that can end up being a lot of money um, and this is a way that keeps it further from students um, all you know uh, and it also raises questions about things like are we um, you know are we spending money fast enough um, or do we in, in in terms of serving current students or are we holding on to things that you know shouldn't be rolling over but have been rolling over um, or that historically were there I mean it just so amazing to me that we have to do this level of work because I, we've done this kind of thing in the past and yet it can slip away so fast. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm grateful that this is a um, an area of the budget that we can focus on because it keeps it further away from the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I look forward to hearing the details because I think it is important that the board get those details about mm -hmm. what it was that you ended up finding the uh, specific areas um, that could be cut. Um, I think that would be really helpful for the board and the public to know. Mm -hmm. um, so will this come forward then as just part of the seventeen eighteen budget? Okay. Yeah. Uh, t the question about does the board need to vote at this point? We're informing you. Here's the strategy. It's really part of the development of next year's budget. Um, to your request, as we develop next year's budget, we will uh, we'll write down and give you the nitty gritty of services and operations as much as we can. Um, it, I think the spreadsheet has 400 lines in it. So yeah. we'll, we'll probably bring the big ticket item savings that we've identified, things that get into at least the five figure range. You know, when we start getting down into like 2000, it's just that's, that's a little too granular. Yeah. But, so I see all of these recommendations feeding into the budget development for next year. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. And we don't have any public comment on this item. Just looking down at the end to be sure. And then we will at this time pop back to item G5. This is the one-to-one -one device recommendation. Mr. Rickman. Good evening, Ms. Parker, President Parker, board members. Um, I'm going to try to be brief because I know it's, it's beginning to get late. I, I was realizing as I was looking at um, my report that um, I talk a lot about the what and the how, but I want to just circle back really quickly to talk a little bit about the why. Um, and I want to acknowledge the great work that uh, Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Drotti and now Ms. Carey is doing around instructional materials. When we talk about devices, what we're really talking about is a vehicle for delivering in st curriculum to students, especially as we move into um, the open educational resource area, that a lot of OERs are, are digital. Um, they're, they're delivered uh, either through a website or through an app. And one of the reasons we need to start to really make a move towards putting devices in the hands of our, our students is because we need to deliver curricular materials. And I was meeting with the DP staff and, and they were asking me questions and I realized that um, that was a, a glaring omission from, from my report because they, were, they, they, they asked why. Well, why, why do we need to do this? And, and uh, as, we, as we look at especially, for instance, our math adoption in, in grades uh, six through eight, the one of the, the leading contenders in the math adoption is an, is an open educational resource that's delivered digitally. So that would be great to pick it, but how are we going to, to get it to kids? So that, that starts with, with, with my discussion. So we have been on a road for a long time uh, around devices. 
And we're going to recommend that an iPad be our primary one-to-one -one device that students will take home. Um, in my narrative, I, t I talk about specifically in detail about the reasons. I just wanted to briefly review them with you. Um, the multidisciplinary uh, nature of an iPad, the fact that it can be used in PE, art, uh, any place where you, would, where you have to put uh, pen to paper is where it's strong. And in grades uh, 7 through 12, where we really need kids to, to have a keyboard, we're going to provide a keyboard case for the iPad so students can continue to do the work they do in Google Docs um, and, and other programs. Um, it helps move to move instruction beyond substitution. I, I include the SAMR model in, in the document. When you think about substitution and you think about devices, often if you were to travel around a lot of our, our classrooms, you don't see the personalized learning that Dr. Matsu, Dr. Matsuosuka, I just, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Chief, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Mr. Matsuoka um, uh, talks about going on. What, what you see is devices being used in ways that we traditionally used either a computer lab Right, so kids are using, instead of using Microsoft Word, they're using Google Docs. Um, they're typing out papers, they're doing internet research. But I wouldn't say that at a lot of our sites you're seeing a ton of innovation being done with the device. And so our hope is, and if you guys have an opportunity, the board has an opportunity to visit our one-to-one -one pilot schools and look at some of the work that's, being, that's going on there, there are some really great examples of, of innovative work with devices happening. Um, the form factor, the fact that it is a tablet allows a student to stand in a hallway and read, lay in bed and read, sit under a tree and read, rather than we've all tried to balance our computers on our laps, on the couch, in our beds. Uh, it just, it's just an easier device to consume information with. Um, the fact that it's a touch screen goes back to my point about uh, we, Ms. Pierce, who we'll be hearing from in a little bit, is using iPads in her math class. Students are taking notes right on the device with a stylus. Uh, they're using Google Classroom then to submit those to her. So they've gone basically paperless, which is a really nice feature that that uh, that you don't get in a device that doesn't have a touch screen. Uh, I know, Ms. Parker, you're aware, because I think your daughter had an iPad, right, that a lot of uh, our students are using the cameras on the iPads to create movies that they then use to do instruction uh, with, their, with their classmates. And going back to Ms. Carey's point about if you, if you teach something, you, you know it. And so that's a, a real strength of the device. Um, I've always said, uh, and the new board members are not aware of this, that this work is really about equity to me and getting the device in the hands of families that wouldn't otherwise have a, a window to the internet in a, in a digital age is, is my life's work. I, that's, I want to close that uh, digital equity gap. Um, the management of the device for us is much easier uh, for both the teachers. There, there's built-in management capabilities for the teachers to control the device in their class, lock the screens, lock the students into apps, and then the cost, which I will get into in a second. Questions on that part piece? Okay. So cost. Um, it seems counterintuitive that an iPad would, would end up costing us uh, less in the long run than uh, Chromebooks. Uh, Chromebooks busted, as I put in my narrative, busted on the market, especially in education because they were so cheap. But if we look at total cost of ownership of the devices, um, based on some assumptions that, I, that I'm making that I, I think are, are um, are logical, reasonable assumptions. Um, the total cost of each device we purchase will be about $164. If we continue our Invest for Learning program, which is where families have uh, the option of purchasing the device with a, a small monthly payment, that payment would be $11.04, uh, which is a great opportunity for a lot of our families. At um, Franklin Elementary, for example, we see about 90% participation in IFL at Franklin. Uh, families have just found it as a, um, an incredible opportunity for them to provide something that they otherwise wouldn't be able to go out and purchase. Um, I forgot that I had this. 
<laughs> uh, our rollout plan. So we've been setting money aside for instructional materials and, and now as we look at OERs, uh, we have money to purchase devices. Um, the rollout plan would be, we had wanted to roll out this year, but it's getting late. So we're going to make a purchase of devices uh, this spring, hopefully, with the board's approval. And then again after July 1st. And so as of August, we would be actually rolling out two years at one time. Uh, so all students, grades 4 through 12, with the exceptions of grades 6, 9, and 12, would have a device. Um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, we're going to talk about how we're going to, the tech coaches are, are the next presentation. We'll talk about how we plan on supporting teachers and the work that's already happened uh, to build capacity to do that, this. Um, but in brief, that's, that's the plan. Uh, and I'm welcome, well, I welcome your questions. Mrs. Moten. So as you stated in, in your comment that now every student's going to take an iPad home, so how is the support in the home environment? So parents, how do we keep them able to support the student through that? Uh, it's an excellent question. So what we really need to do is, is work with community partners to make sure that we can get internet in the homes of all of our students. Right now that that's, that is uh, a real problem for some of our families. Uh, I've been in communication with Cox over the past couple of years trying to develop a plan with that. Now that we have actual a possible rollout date, I, I've asked to meet with them again and we're setting up a meeting time. But that's going to take some work. Um, the city of Santa Barbara is not interested in doing uh, citywide internet uh, like Lompoc did. Uh, so we're going to have to be creative. One of the advantages of, of using a device like an iPad is that the stu it has offline capabilities, so the students can take material home and work on it. Uh, it doesn't have to be online to be fully functional. Uh, but that, that's something we're going to have to continue to work at. We're going to have to push community partners, uh, and we're going to have to find others that want to help us. Okay. And then just to follow up, um, more of a, a human connection comment in terms of, I know we're moving forth in the 21st century, but it's so essential that we make that, keep that human connection. It's so easy to do it when you have a device to not talk to each other, send a message. Send, and so we lose that, that connection. I was at um, a speak, women speak up, it just happened to be the women speak up, and you know, students got up and talked about how stressed they are, and it's like, who can we talk to? So when we're in this environment of technology, we lose that that balance of that human communication. So is that something that you're thinking about, you know, as we get more technological? Yeah, I'd like to make two observations about that. One, I, I completely agree with you. And, and if you were to visit our one-to-one -one classrooms, the devices are not, uh, not being used all the time. Uh, they're used uh, during instruction, during periods of instruction, but not not an entire school day, not even half of a school day. Students are still going out on the playground and playing with each other. I would also add, I sat on a panel recently where this came up, and, and I actually argued that kids are communicating with each other more now than ever. Uh, that is not the face-to-face -face communication like you're talking about, which is an important skill that we still need to develop in students. But I would say students today are more globally aware than they ever have been because of technology. They communicate with people around the globe. Um, so while the communication is taking place in a different form, I, I would argue it's happening more. That's not to say that we, we shouldn't continue to be sure that, that students are developing the ability to speak with people face to face. Right, because you also see, you know, you get courage behind the, the devices as well. So I'm just saying that's, that's an important thing that we, as a value, we need to make sure as we're going forward that that's, we don't lose that piece. 100% agree. You know, in, in yeah. terms of that and how do we incorporate that as part of a responsibility of our students and really hearing them. So I think you said there's, there's talking even though you're not necessarily talking. So in terms of, yeah, you have, you increased your awareness, you increased your um, international connection and sort of yeah. more globally right. but what we see when we don't pay attention to that we have that coming back in much more de devastating ways so yes. it's important to keep that up yes. Ms. Caps, thank you for excuse me thank you for addressing this in the terms of equity I concur with that I just on the on the lines of um, Wi-Fi in the homes or internet in the homes do you have a sense of 
percentage that were what, hmm. that what is a challenge for us for as a district? I, I couldn't give you exact numbers. I know, um, as expected, at, at Franklin, uh, it's a real challenge. At Adams, not so much. Uh, yeah. That's 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 information we could try to get for you, though. Yeah. I'm just curious because I know Cox. I, I've just heard anecdotally they do have a program, but I've heard that it really just hits sort of the, the most extreme poverty, and, and it, it and it could be expanded again. I'm not. It's it's not their program. It's a federal program that they oh. have agreed to 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 participate in called Connect to Compete. That's and right. one yeah. of the issues with it is that it doesn't touch all the art students that really need the help. And two, it comes with all sorts of strings connected. Oh, so right. you, you have to you, sign up for an account. And all you that. couldn't have been a Cox Cable uh, customer in the so many prior years. You, there, there's just all sorts of things that are barriers to our families. Now it's improved, right. but it's still not great. And, and our schools all have, I mean, this is an obvious question. I've just heard that Franklin, uh, the fact that Wi-Fi is there, um, Casey just mentioned to me anecdotally again years ago that that's really increased how many parents and f kids hang around. I mean, we were talking about it in the context of getting dinner as well. But um, I imagine, so all the schools are fully Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, all of them. And, and yeah. it's interesting that you mentioned that we've gotten, we got a call once that said, hey, do you know at night your parking lots have families sitting in cars? And we do. They, yeah. they, they hang out uh, so they can get Wi-Fi signals. Yeah. And that's apparently uh, helped make the campuses more safe at night and all that. Right, and we've always said that we want our um, our school sites to be community hubs uh, and find ways to keep them open longer. And, and so this would be a reason uh, to make that happen. Well, it would be great if Cox, I mean, maybe there's something to work on. I work with them a fair amount. If there's a more ability to get that program expanded or or more impactful. I think yeah, we're a huge customer for them, so sure. I, I, I hope sure. that uh, they will work with us to make that happen for, for our students. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Reed and then Mr. Ewell. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, maybe creatively thinking in terms of the after school programs that we offer, like the AOK programs, that there might be sort of um, an aspect of technology that can building the hubs that already exist and utilizing the after school programs may as a as a sort of place for students to um, actually get support in the internet and also with the work that their homework so maybe integrating that in the after school. A absolutely and I would say not only uh, absolutely but also the not only there but at our pro programs like at Frank Franklin and uh, La Cumbra where we can also bring families in and help instruct them as well uh, what we've seen uh, at our schools is the devices end up being used by by family members to do some really amazing things as I as I put in my narrative so yeah Mr. Eola. And I'm sure you probably addressed this when the program first rolled out, but I just remember reading the LAUSD rollout of the iPads thing, so I just wanted to ask about uh, security, and I'm sure there's like parental like blocks and whatnot, um, but just kind of what things do we have in place to make sure that those blocks don't get hacked, because I remember that specifically was one of the big things at LAUSD, aside from the whole nepotism ordering thing. Yeah. <laughs> that little thing. You know, what's very interesting, and thank you for asking that, is that the LAUSD uh, rollout wasn't as big of a disaster as it was made out to be. Um, you know, you, you think about the number of students in that district and the, what they were trying to do and how many devices. It, it actually got a lot of bad press. Um, we have, you can't, so, so one of the things that LA, uh, USD ran into is that students figured out a way to delete what we call the mobile device manager profile from the device. So they, they then, the district had no control over it anymore. Um, you can't do that anymore. You, you know, a lot of things have changed also with the technology through that experience. So they learned and, and the hard way and, and um, companies have now developed ways to keep students from doing that. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. When the device goes home, um, it's still managed by our mobile device manager and it has restrictions on it. The only difference between it being on our campus and being at home is on our campus, it goes through our filter. At home, it doesn't. So we message to parents, this is a partnership between the district and you. You, you have to pay attention to what your student is doing. Uh, we can only restrict the device so much when it's at home. Hmm. Yeah. And 
And um, you said this in the past, but um, what about theft and breakage? What are um, so what we've seen about a ten percent breakage, theft, and loss rate, uh, which is actually I thought it would be higher, which is really good. Uh, one of the nice things about the iPad is that it it has built-in theft deterrent. It doesn't spray you with ink anything. I thought that would, that would be nice. Um, but what it does do is that if you report it lost to us, we put it in lost mode, and then it, it becomes a brick. You can't get it out of lost mode. No one can get it out of lost mode except us. And so what we found is that we've, we've had a few stolen, and people realize, well, I can't sell this. They can't use it for anything, and so they're, they're not taking them. Okay. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. One is that I, I know that there have been members of the community that have been frustrated at how long the iPad pilot went on. It went on much longer than uh, was originally attended, intended. Uh, yeah, but I, I appreciate it, though. I think yeah. that it's ended up being a good thing. Yeah. Um, that we've learned a lot over the past few years, and even whether or not this was appropriate to move forward, because mm -hmm. it was not a slam dunk that this was the direction that we should go. Correct. Um, and so I appreciated getting the teacher feedback that we got over the years. Um, parent feedback and student feedback. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm supportive of this plan with the idea of, I, I know that for some uh, courses, Chromebooks are still better. And so I, I, I just wanted to be careful that we are not a district that turns into like, you have this, you know, you can only use this thing, or we won't buy replacements for that thing because it's the only thing that we're doing. And I think that um, that can cause a lot of classroom frustration when that happens. Um, and so I appreciate the flexibility of that. Um, I do think that, uh, and I'm sure we're about to hear more about this, that teachers can do really great innovative things digitally. There are lots of teachers that do great innovative things that are not digital. I, I almost feel like we spent too much time focusing on how would this improve student learning, um, which it can do. Um, but there is still that basic piece that you are also saying of the reality, which is why I'm supportive of this, is that um, you know so many resources are um, dynamic and change and um, and free when we get them digitally and um, it is you know I, I, I don't think you know, we were going to see test scores improve except for the fact that this is the way you would access the curriculum so I think it's really important just to keep in mind that this is just the direction that all districts are going in um, and so it's it's um, it, it doesn't mean that it, that every teacher is going to embrace being super creative uh, with their iPads. Um, it does mean that um, there are going to be some baseline things that students wouldn't be able to do if they didn't have them. And you know, I, I've been really proud of how we have handled it, and I say we including the board. We have never said that this is going to improve student test scores. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've talked about the equity issue. We've talked about access. Um, and, and now the necessity around uh, around delivering curriculum is is really where we're at. Um, and I also agree, and, and I, I want to stress that we don't expect teachers to be digital ninjas, okay. right? Um, I understand that there will be teachers who are really motivated to do incredible things with this these tools, but there are teachers doing incredible things. Uh, without them. Uh, I've always said, coming from a, a family of educators, you give a teacher a stick and a rock and a place to teach kids and they'll do amazing things. So um, I couldn't agree more. And, and your last point, point about uh, having other devices, we will continue to have that. We have to have that. Um, Good, uh, because I noticed that we were just buying a bunch of Chromebooks for Santa Barbara Junior High, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. The, okay, the, so the, the needs proof of, is in the pudding yeah, here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other pieces, um, wireless, uh, I think it would be good to actually know the data for our district um, to get that information from parents. Um, in December, the Santa Barbara Public Library started offering free internet um, hotspots. Hot spots. Yeah. And I don't know if that's something that we could either collaborate with them or if it's something that's affordable enough that if we have certain families that need that, that we could uh, do that. Yeah, I thought about that, make them available like in our libraries to mm -hmm. check out. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, um, that would be helpful. And then I'm just taking a look at the 
Um, and you feel confident that we can take over the IFL and have, and that's that will be. Yeah, you know, we have learned so much on the IFL front. I, I feel more confident about that than um, some other things. We've, we've done a lot of good work on that. It's, it's, it's hard work, but it's, it's, I think it's worth it because of the, the equity piece. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciated Ms. Sims Moten's um, comment because uh, as much as we, um, look at students and think that they know so much and that they're looking at things across the globe and stuff, but the reality is they need a tremendous amount of guidance. And <laughs> I really feel like we are um, too haphazard about that. Um, and it's not just Santa Barbara Unified, it's everybody. We're too haphazard about it and we need to have something comprehensive that our, um, our tech leaders are helping teachers. We have to have a, a plan, like K-12, like this is where we're, you know, putting this in and this is, you know, the librarians are going to be doing this and the classroom teachers are going to be doing that and and then families just need, because the, the when the iPad goes home for the first time, if they have not had it at home, you know, they have to create rules and they're going to have fights with their, you know, and I hate to create that for families. Um, and so I, I really think that that's important that we be responsible partners in that. It's 100% so, true. Yeah. Mr. Yoa. Uh, just one last question. Sorry, I was looking at the breakage, theft, and loss, and this is uh, sprung in my head when, uh, this week when I was reading it. So you say we're gonna, if we go one on one, we're gonna forego the Apple Care plus the, which is seventy nine dollars plus a fifty dollar per deductible, um, and it would be cheaper to to just save up our own. Like I'm just curious as to like. So because we, when you do Apple Care, you have to. It's either all or nothing. Mm -hmm. So we have to. So we're gonna buy. 3,600 iPads approximately at a time. So if you say we're going to do Apple Care, we buy, it's an extra $79 for each one of those devices, even though only 10% of those devices are going to break. Mm -hmm. And so the cost to just actually just replace a whole iPad, we, we, would, we would be better off banking that money mm -hmm. and self-insuring, basically. So that that's the plan. Okay, so it would be about replacing them, not repairing them. No, we would repair them. I'm just saying that even if we wanted to replace them wholesale, okay. we would be better off. Okay. Yeah, we can replace them for about. Right now, I'm I'm, I'm working with Apple uh, on figuring out what I asked them for was. I said it would be so beneficial for schools if we didn't have to pay for Apple Care up front, but we paid maybe more per incident. So right now we pay $79 for Apple Care and then $50 per incident. What if we just paid $100 per incident? Mm -hmm. And that was their way of, so we're, I'm working on them with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and where would we go? Because I know even just trying to fix my dad's I broken iPhone screen is like 100 bucks. Like, right. or do, do we add in yeah, I, I can, I'll fix it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. just send them all to you. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> uh, we, would, we, so we would work with Apple. So Apple would do it for us. And there's also companies that actually contract with schools to do this work. So we have a lot of options. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, we'll look forward to that moving forward. All right, thanks. And then item G, uh, G6, yes, tech coach program update. So I want to thank, I, I feel very lucky to, um, to work in a district with incredible teachers. And there are no group of teachers more incredible than our tech coaches. Um, and so I will uh, ask them to introduce themselves. I told them that they would probably be going around eight. <laughs> oh, dear God. So, so sorry. That, so here Welcome they are. Welcome to our world. Yeah. I owe them. I, yeah. I, I will take them out to lunch sometime soon. So I'm going to let them do a, a brief introduction and talk about the work they've been doing. Hi, good evening. My name is Amy McMillan and I teach English at Goleta Valley Junior High and I work as a tech coach at Goleta Valley Junior High and La Colina and other schools as well. Good evening everyone. My name is Adrian Macias. I teach at Santa Barbara High School. I teach social studies and I'm also a wrestling coach. Hello, my name is David Lovejoy. I support all 10 elementary schools and am a 100% tech coach. Hello everyone, I'm Gina Pierce. I'm a math teacher at Dos Pueblos High School. I'm also the technology coach out there and at Santa Barbara Junior High. 
Hello, I'm Lara Wilbanks, and I teach social studies at San Marcos High School and the yearbook there, and I'm a tech coach there as well. Hi, I'm Helen Murdoch, and I'm actually the, I've just changed over from San Marcos. I'm now the social studies coach for the district, and I work at La Cuesta, Alta Vista, and La Cumbra for the tech. And I'm going to start, if you can go to our next. Thank you. So the first three or four years of this tech coach program, i got to tell you there's been a lot of changes. Every year or so, we evaluate the program, figure out what we need to do, how are things changing, what tech do we have, and what does that mean for all of us. And so we started out with a few tech coaches at the high schools, and then we also each worked with some of the elementary schools and at least one junior high each. And our goal was to sort of help the teachers figure out what was going on. We were all getting iPads and Apple TVs in our classroom, and we didn't really know what to do with them. So it was our job to introduce teachers to that. How do you use an iPad? What are apps? How do you work them? What's good for what subjects? And just everything that was coming their way. We then added integrators, which were teachers who got a period off at the junior highs and the high schools. And at the elementary schools, they got a stipend because they can't take time off during the day. Um, it doesn't work that way. So they, their goal was to learn how to integrate technology into the curriculum. So they got to innovate and experiment. They also worked to help teachers who didn't know as much um, as they did. We added mentors who got a stipend and also were people who were comfortable with technology. And there, the idea was that mentors would work with mentees, and mentees were the people who didn't know about technology and who were a little afraid of it. And the idea was that they would meet once a week, they would have this wonderful mentor-mentee relationship, and it didn't really work that great. <laughs> um, it was sort of a false relationship we discovered that sometimes we didn't have enough teachers in one subject who were mentors to be the mentees. You know, the subjects didn't line up, and it, we just discovered it didn't really work that great after about a year or so. Um, and all of those people worked with teachers one-on-one -on -one to help them with whatever they needed. And the tech coaches found that we didn't just do one-on-one -on -one work, it, but we became the technology people at the schools, um, particularly the high schools. Any tech question that came up, it was, find your tech coach, and they will fix it. They will find the answer. And so, and at different schools, we've done different things. We've ended up purchasing the technology with the administration. So I think we put that in the narrative, that there's all, s anything to do with technology sort of became our, our bailiwick. Is that a fair? statement. So that was the first few years and we changed who the tech coaches were. We had some personnel shifts as we went along, um, but that got us through the first three or four years. All right. Do you have the slides? And then um, in the interim from 2015 till now, um, we, a lot remained the same, but we made some changes. Uh, there were some changes in tech coaches. For example, I came on board, I think Dave that year. And um, we kept the integrators, so I'll just speak to secondary. Secondary and elementary are a little different. But the at the secondary sites, we still have at least one integrator at each site, sometimes more if it's a high school. And they get a period off um, with the purpose of trying out innovative uses of technology in their classroom. It's just a gift of time. But then we added a responsibility, actually two responsibilities. The integrator now has to post to the iLearn blog every other month. We have a blog, iLearn.sbunified.org, about um, some of the things they're doing in their classrooms. And they also have to facilitate a workshop every month during PLC time. Um, the mentors are a little different now. They are mostly former integrators. So in other words, they got a prep period off for a full year, and then they made a two-year commitment to keep helping us with the program, helping teachers, and also facilitating one workshop a month um, during PLC time. And the iLearn workshops, we put in your narrative a link to some of the topics we've covered, but um, sometimes it's a particular digital tool. Sometimes it might be a topic um, regarding digital citizenship or digital literacy. Sometimes it might be um, an open education resource. And basically, we send out a survey every month trying to get information from teachers of what they want. So sometimes it's just specific teacher requests of what they want to workshop on. And I uh, think that's it for secondary. Yeah? So elementary is a little different, uh, mostly just because of the way the PLCs are designed. Um, 
At the elementary, we get about 15 to 20 minutes per district-wide PLC to do a tech presentation. So we have two integrators at every grade level who help support that presentation. I meet with the integrators once a month and we kind of design what the PLC will look like and we go over it and make sure that it's uh, what the teachers need and what the teachers have asked for. And, um, and yeah, so that's great because it's 100% participation from the whole um, elementary school. Um, we also have, they actually use the iLearn blog, so they post also on the blog, and they use that blog for their presentation, so it's a great reference and a reason for teachers to go on the blog and search it, so it's a good plug for that also. Um, we also, as just tech coaches, I know we did, not everything's mentioned here, we also do professional development for staff sometimes, and um, I also do co-teaching. Uh, I go into the classroom, teach with a teacher. It's great because it really lowers the affect of the teacher. It really values their time. They don't have to meet after school. They can actually see model teaching happening and get ideas from that, and they really appreciate that. Um, so I think that's really that's been something that's really worked out well, and something I've been developing more and more. Um, also, um, I think uh, I heard w Wendy said something about um, you know using tech as a babysitter kind of, and I think one of the things that we also do is that we tell help teachers know when a certain application should be used in a lesson. So you know teachers will say, oh, okay, I have this great app, and I say, well, that's actually an assessment app. We should probably use that at the end of this lesson. You should maybe have them meet up and do some inquiry-based group research work and things like that. So a lot of what we do is help them know when to use an app, how to use it, um, you know, kind of some apps are definitely more innovative than others. Some will allow uh, students to, you know, the class just to walls to be torn down and them to collaborate outside to the country, like all over the world, uh, Skype people in different countries. It's, it's, it's really kind of opening their world so that it's meaningful uh, instead of just something that just sticks them in front of them, multiple choice, you know, things that could be done. So like, like she said, it, it's really about how we use technology too. Um, and I think I also uh, manage the resource website for teachers and students and I think uh, I've been trying to do some district PD with uh, some new uh, professional development techniques like an unconference and webinars I've had uh, Apple come in and talk to teachers about using Apple classroom and uh, I'm planning a makerspace coming up soon with Adams um, and, and I'm also kind of experimenting with this iLearn Academy that I'm just starting to work on with uh, video tutorials, uh, vetted video tutorials for teachers. So, I'm sorry, it's long. Okay, so where we are going is a really great question given all that we've been discussing and Mr. Rickman's been discussing tonight. And we have really two goals. They're not up there, but as a team of tech coaches, and this is my first year on the team, Adrian as well, that I just first want to say it's really fun to be a part of a team that is supportive of each other. We meet twice a week and we're in constant communication. It's really great. But as a team, we've been discussing kind of themes for next year and those themes being being flexible and being supportive and that we will do what it takes to, out, to roll out this program and that we really want to be there for teachers. We really want to embrace the role of coach for our, the staffs that we work with. So what that will look like is we'll continue on with this tech coach team and we're in the process of looking at adding two more uh, science tech coach for secondary and an another elementary tech coach as is in your narrative as well. We're going to continue offering iLearn workshops and in the narrative I think there's a link that gives you a list of some of the topics we've offered in the past and we'll probably run some of those topics again and continue especially to support teachers um, if we roll out the one-to-one -one with the iPads and we'll be offering those quarterly in the next year and continue with um, integrators, men well mentors I mean, continue with the mentors and with um, possibly even tech coaches doing the iLearn and blog and writing more posts. And so that's where we're going right now. And I'm going to let Gina open up questions. Yeah, we welcome any questions. Or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Comments or questions, board members? How do you measure your effectiveness? Like, how do you know that you're doing a good job for teachers that you're serving? 
actually keep track of, of how many people you're serving or how does that work? So we have a survey that we send out at the end of um, every workshop that we offer every month and then um, anybody that signs up well our survey numbers are you know they're kind of low but we do get feedback based off of whether um, it was valuable what suggestions do they have and then they can rate it on a scale of you know one to five I think is what our system is and then we just kind of take that back and go from there we always have a question even um, in the survey and when they sign up for a workshop. If there's not a workshop that you see there, let us know what can we offer you. So we're constantly trying to get input from the, the teachers to see what they're looking for. Um, and then right now we have a lot of teachers like on our team. So the coaches work with um, the integrators and the mentors, which were previous integrators. We have most content areas represented. So they're working with their PLCs and they're going back to their PLC saying, hey, what do you guys want to see? And so um, we're getting feedback through the team that way as well. I, I'd also like to add that one of the things we didn't mention, and maybe it's in the narrative, is that our model is that they, uh, the, the tech coaches, with the exception of, of Dave Lovejoy, well, and Helen, because she's a, a full-time release TOSA, they all teach a period. So they're teaching a period, and then they're a tech coach, which, which gives them a lot more credibility with teachers because they can say, hey, I tried this in my class, and it didn't work, or I did this, and it was great. Um, so we think it's a model that works. Dr. Reed? Yeah, um, I think it's great what you're all doing. And, um, but I guess um, my question is, for teachers, the gift of time, you know, of really, I mean, you, you know, I see that you're talking about co-constructing and collaborating um, in the elementary level, but where is the time embedded for the teachers to actually have a conversation? I know you have the workshops and, and those different opportunities, but, um, you know, time is is really a gift for teachers to have that time, that opportunity that would be dedicated to something like this. Well, yeah, time is a constant struggle. It really is. So, um, the, those of us who are teaching, we are members of PLCs, functioning PLCs. So we meet with them anyways. Um, and then the other thing that most of us do is we just try to station ourselves in high traffic areas so people see us and go, oh. I mean, to ask you this, I mean, every day, that's how I do a lot of collaborating. <laughs> that's pretty smart. <laughs> All right, any other questions about it? Okay, thank you. I, I particularly appreciate this background because, as you know, um, a lot of new members of the board that don't know what you've been doing, and so this is just a first big picture of it, and it's very, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add yeah. to that, you know, because a while ago, I, I think I was at one of the meetings um, that you spoke initially about the rollout of, of the laptops and the tech program. And to get this history and understanding and the, the compre comprehensive approach to how you're doing it and then how you're integrating it and what you're doing, I mean, it really, really helps to, to provide a history and an integration piece. Um, so I appreciate very much and, and your time tonight at 9.45. Thank you. <laughs> I also just want to comment. I, I've seen you around, but I haven't really learned about your work. So it was really helpful for me to, to see through tonight what you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank guys you. very much. Are we excused? You're <laughs> no, you have to stay to the very end. As, as you can probably tell, we have no fun working together. <laughs> yeah. So we're now at item G7, and I'll note that it's getting late, so we'll try to wrap things up fairly quickly here. Um, this is the uh, first look at the board annual calendar. Mr. Mutz woke up. I think it was at the CSBA conference. Either I was in a session or I, I, yeah, I've been wanting to do this for school boards for a while and I finally just sat down and got on my big screen and mapped it out and this will be a living document um, what's it's a great document it's also bad for us because oh gosh then we got to deliver stuff we got to hit deadlines but you know we're the leaders of the district if we don't hold ourselves to a standard on eval it's really a lot of evaluation of our work and as I listen to the board reports 
Um, there are a couple of line items and different things that I thought we need to start monitoring. Um, so literacy. You've heard a lot from us about literacy, especially in the K-2 space. So uh, actually, um, Dr. Ramirez wasn't in this conversation, but I was talking with uh, Dr. Mora and um, uh, Ms. Guillermo Juan, and they actually pushed the date by a month, but they said, we can do this, just let us slide, because it's around reclassification timings and collecting STAR data. But I so look forward to, are we making gains in literacy in the K-2 space? And then after I heard the attendance report, I, I just looked it up, our district-wide attendance average is 93.4%. We, we can do better. We will do better, and so I think we need to get attendance updates on a quarterly basis. Like, are the numbers getting better? Um, we actually have some really good data from Dos Pueblos High School that focused on it, and someday we'll bring that positive story. Um, there, there's some traditional items in here, you know, budget development, you can see the cycle, but for new board members, it's maybe helpful to see, oh, this is when we do first in and second, and then budget adoption. Um, there's one that we actually haven't had a chance to talk about in cabinet. It's an annual report on student mental health and well-being. And I think that's different than the discipline attendance. That's a very different space. And I see a lot of head nods. It's, it's, it's going to be an interesting conversation for how do we even report on that. How do we collect data? How do we evaluate that? And we have a lot of partners. And you know we are we know that we need to evaluate all of our work. So um, there's a line item about my work plan <laughs> evaluation. Um, I owe you a spring work plan because we're in March and I just, I got to get to it. I have to give you the feedback for the winter work plan. So so there's there's a first look at it. I think it will grow and change as we experience it. So open to your comments and suggestions. Yes, I mean, I was taking a look and thinking this is a great first pass, and I know that as we as we go through, we'll be thinking of like, oh, there's something that this does happen every year, and we should put it in somewhere on one of these uh, squares. But I, I I know that this had come up at CSBA that this would be incredibly helpful, and I think it will be incredibly helpful. Miss Simmons Mountain, I'm just saying that I'm plagiarizing it tomorrow in my staff meeting. <laughs> so <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a really good, you know, um, general broad overview of the higher level things it's so easy to get into details of it but then it doesn't give you like okay in January we know what we're doing in these areas so I really appreciate you bringing that and showing that out and this is a good um, complete picture of the year yeah. you know? thank, so thank you for you. that wonderful idea I'm gonna do that too yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, so as you think of things, you know, be sure to let Mr. Matsuoka know that there are things that you think we should add to the calendar, but in general, I think it's a great format and a really helpful tool. It sounds like we've got some uh, universal agreement on that. I also want the board to realize, I think what's valuable about this is for the board to weigh the workload because I, I have experienced in my many years as a superintendent, oh, let's, it would be great to hear that report. Oh, how about this report? And these one-off requests, they don't feel like that much, but when you overlay it in the context of the rhythm of our workload, uh, the time and energy of our cabinet, um, this is gonna be really a good discipline. It's like, oh, if you wanna develop a new report, we'll certainly be open to it, but where does it fit? July. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's that. <laughs> it's in July. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it would be a really yeah. short report. <laughs> so, All right. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. And let's move on to item H. We are returning to consent items E4 and E6. So E4, Ms. Simsburton. <coughs> This is the approval of catering agreement between the University Club of Santa Barbara and San Marcos High School for a 2017 senior prom. I just have a question. The agreement states that the deposit is due January 20th and we're past that. So do we already make the deposit? Um, I don't know about that level of detail. I know there was a date change. I thought that's what your question was about. Yeah, I didn't see the date change okay. in here, so that's why I was asking that if we're 
you can still be able to have that spot. And also, um, on the estimate, it didn't reflect the $1,500 deposit. That's just me probably being in the details of it. But if somebody can look at that, to, uh, it's on the, um, on the estimate, actually. I don't know if you can pull that up. So this is, yeah, there's actually a change. Let's see, does it? I can tell you that due to the date change, which um, Ms. Parker caught, okay. the backstory, I don't know if you care about the date change, but the backstory is that they were looking for a, a location other than the USAN, which is where they had held homecoming. And, and so the new date is June 3rd. Um, of the prom itself. Right. But does that change? And so I directed the San Marcos staff to go back and revisit the catering contract after yeah. that catch to just make sure that that was in line with the new plans for okay. their prom. Okay. So I'll, I can follow up with that specific question. Okay. And then on the actual estimate, I just want to make sure they're saying they're holding our deposit, but it doesn't show that it's coming back to us at the bottom there. If you scroll up, Brian, right there at the bottom. On that security deposit, it doesn't show it coming out or doing anything. So because they were asking for it up front, but just something to look at. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all I have, so. Do I need all right, so you'd be wonderful if you made a motion. A motion to approve <laughs> the Cadian agreement for the University Club in Santa Marcos High School for prom. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that passed unanimously. And then the next was item E6. This is approval of minutes for the March 10th, 2015, and February 18th, 2017 Board of Education meetings. Mr. Matsuoka. Um, yeah, just my question is 2015 would be, I mean, it's, oh, I thought it was really just a oversight. I don't know. So I've spoken to staff because okay. Ms. Parker also brought this up. Uh, apparently, when no, when we switched to Novus in the fifteen sixteen year, was that the first year? I'm looking at that was the second year. Second year, we had some technical difficulties with Novus, and so we're actually finally catching up on getting the minutes approved. It's going to be all on Miss Parker to remember if it was accurate. <laughs> well, I was telling you that the video is there if you want to. Yeah, that's watch true. It, but, um, <laughs> so, okay. um, yeah, so I was commenting on, on needing to get those cleaned up because it isn't really fair either to the public that, that, that there's been this delay and also to you because you, unless you go back and review the video, you don't know for mm -hmm. sure that it's accurate. Um, so, uh, but we do need to take votes on this because mm -hmm. we do need to get them ratified. Um, so, there's also one uh, correction on the date, the February 18th, 2017. That actually is February 14th. 14th, yeah. Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Okay, I move approval with corrections. And now we look at the video for you to know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Second. All right, moved by Ms. Sims Moden and seconded by Mr. Uyoa. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And those minutes are uh, ratified uh, and approved at this point. Which brings us to coming events. <coughs> spring, spring break is coming. <laughs> Um, and I want to note, because we do talk uh, in item L, the next meeting is Tuesday, April 4th, which is an off-cycle meeting for us. Um, so I want to be sure that the public is aware and that we remember that we are here on the 4th and not the 11th, the next time we meet due to the spring break and needing to meet, meet, meet earlier. Um, any other coming events that we should be noting for the next week? Um, future agenda items? Do you have the dogs back on there? Are we going to bring the, uh, the drug dogs back? Yeah. Uh, yeah that's yeah. About it generally. Yeah, yeah, that's on the list. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yep. Um, another one that I would like to add to the list is board policy 1400. Um, we had um, uh, students uh, and then also community members in the fall talk to us about um, improving access, increasing access to election, uh, to voting, voter registration at our high schools. Hmm. And um, it is captured in board policy 1400. Um, and we need to take a look at that, especially because the law changes since that was last revised, where you can pre-register to vote, to vote starting at age 16. Um, and so hmm. ways that we can make it more of uh, 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 something that happens automatically starting at age, probably for juniors, um, you know, 11th graders, not just 12th graders. Um, 
that we make that that's something that's accessible. So board policy, 1400. That's funny. I had someone approach me at a, I think the Santa Barbara Political Women's, and they want to make that a celebration, a big celebration about you know being able to vote and getting our kids more uh, involved at an earlier age. And so I just said, I referred her to, to Fran. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> <that call. laughs> All right. Yes. The word, okay. word policy reminds me and us that we sent out uh, a short stack, and we were planning on bringing that to the board at the April 4th board meeting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All that. Be ready. Uh, HR, be ready. That's your spring break is for. All right. So uh, that brings us to item K. And if there is no, uh, we've already talked about item L. Um, you know, we need to just change that. Can item L always be? the next meeting and then item K be adjournment so that we can bring that up. Mm -hmm. Let's make a change. Um, and uh, if my board does not object, I will move to adjourn this meeting. So